And we are live. I am Mod Hotep, producer, songwriter, engineer. We have a guest uh, in Tremaine Williams. Yes, sir. We're going to get off the introductions first of everybody here. Let Tremaine tell us a, a couple of things, like maybe his new artist, uh, what he has going on. And then we'll uh, hop off into questions and get this started. Andrew Glassford. Introduce Howdy yourself. Get oh. Howdy guys, uh, Andrew here, uh, studio assistant at Project 9 uh, Studios in Northwich in Cheshire uh, in the UK. Yeah, looking to learn some stuff. Let's get involved. Derek. Hey, Derek Motes, uh, independent producer, um, recording engineer, and uh, songwriter uh, from outside of the Detroit area. And... Uh, just out here like everybody else, trying to come up, always learning. All right, Eli. Hey, my name is Eli. I'm uh, originally from Barbados, but I'm out here in LA. Uh, and a uh, producer, engineer, and uh, just trying to learn from my boy Tremaine. And uh, just happy to be hanging with you guys today. Mr. Urban, a.k.a. Hugh. Hey, I'm Hugh, uh, songwriter, uh, producer, engineer, and I'm uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And I want to learn from the best that's on here now. Mr. Kamek. Bill Kamek, video editor, music mixer, social media guy in New York City. And we have our guest, Tremaine Usher, Jill Scott, Janet Jackson, Original 7, which uh, he'll have to tell y'all what that is. Uh, tell us about your uh, what you have going on right now, Tremaine. Introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your artist. All right. Uh, I'm Tremaine Williams. Uh, my company is 6-7 Music. I'm out here in Los Angeles. Um, been out here about nine years. Uh, with well, my company, I have uh, an artist I'm developing right now named Brittany Wallace. It's R&B, so I think like Faith Evans meets Brandy, like somewhere in the middle of there. Um, and I'm also about to start scoring uh, my next film and hopefully get some original songs in there as well. And uh, like he said, you know, the credits and I worked for Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis for about three and a half, four years, and uh, along with Eli, who's in here as well. All right, Hugh, hit him with your first question. Um, I was looking at your, your bio on, on the UAD website. So, you know, I'm a drummer as well, but what makes the difference with putting the drums first and versus the vocals with you? Like, have you tried it the other way around? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do it any, there's, I, I've learned, especially with Jam and Lewis, there's no rules to this, you know what I'm saying? If there was a formula, then everybody would have a hit, you know? It's kind of just, you know, you go with what works at that moment, so some days I'll have a ton of drums, other days, uh, like, I'll sit down and just do drum patterns in my MP, and then other days I'll sit down and come up with a keyboard, and uh, come up with piano stuff first. Other days, I might have uh, a melody or something in my head, and then go from there and work. I guess it would be considered backwards, you know. But uh, it just depends on you know the vibe that day. There's no, I, I do it this way. I start this way because it's you know you're pulling from thin air. Your creativity. There's no rules to this. Okay. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. You muted. Dwayne, Dwayne, you've just yeah. come in. Uh, yeah, I just muted up real quick. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Dwayne. Hi, I'm Dwayne. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, producer here. Uh, this is my living, and uh, that's about it. Ah, what's up, man? Dwayne, Dwayne, we've been talking about you. We've been calling you Mr. Question, so I'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> and see if you can actually come up with a question real quick. Hit him with one. Oh, wow. Right on the spot like that, huh? Um... Sure. Uh, I'm always fascinated about um, the aspect of keeping yourself uh, engaged in your own work where you are, um, uh, you don't burn out. Uh, how do you keep from professionally um, getting too much or too, too, uh, too into it, too, uh, I, I'm trying to think of a phrase for that. You know, just uh, like down the rabbit hole, you're lost too much. Uh, right. Well, no, like you, like you said, getting burned out, pretty much. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, that works. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, I've, I've learned. Uh, I I kind of hop around enough so I don't get bored. Because when you get burned out, you kind of get bored with what you're doing. So I hop around. So I'll do. Uh, I'll engineer sessions. I'll produce. Uh, I'll songwrite. I'll do vocal production. Um, I'll go do these BT shows where I'm the Pro Tools operator. And so all these different things, like you're constantly changing your hat so you're not just getting bored staying in one lane. You know what I'm saying? So you don't really burn yourself out because after I'm done with this film, then I'll run down and do Sunday Best. Then I'll come back and work on a record. You know what I'm saying? So it's constantly something that keeps you on your toes so you don't really burn yourself out. All right, all right, and the uh, the, the multiple hats and um, being skilled at everything. Do you find that people forget that you're great at something else as well? Because a lot of um, even when I'm the, the come up is, oh, you're good at that one thing. We're only going to use you for that one thing. How did you branch out so successfully? Um, I mean, it. I started in production, and uh, then I went to Full Sail to to get my engineering stuff together because I didn't understand the technical side of things. And so from that, I became a better engineer, which led me to be a better producer. And so I was, and then I realized, like, wait a minute, there's a whole other stream of income uh, being an engineer. So I'll go do these engineering gigs, and when I go do them, I put on my engineer hat, and I just stay in my lane. I don't really care if they forget that I'm a producer. Because uh, you're paying me to be the engineer, so that's what I'm going to do for you. And when you pay me to be producer, I mean, for the most part, I haven't had a situation where people forgot that I did other stuff. Uh, but I mean, if they hire me for that one thing, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try to step on the producer's toes and kind of, you know, try to do his job for him. It's like you pay me to press record, so that's what I'm going to do. And JD, welcome. Introduce yourself, bro. Hey guys, my name is JD. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Sound engineer, not really a producer. Kind of work with a lot of different genres: alternative metal, rock, indie, but really new to R&B. Did a bit of pop, and yeah, hang around this forum quite a bit now. And yes, recently, as I told earlier as well. Uh, starting a video production company, so getting into video side of things as well for music videos and well, live music videos as well, so that's what's been happening with me. Are you on the road driving? Not driving at the moment, just pulled over. <coughs> I was about to say, we're going to have a recorded crash. <laughs> we were just talking about that. <laughs> as we see JD flip over. <laughs> You have any questions, real quick? I put you on the spot. Do you have any questions, real quick, JD? Oh, he's fading out. Okay. Um, Tremaine, India Irie, one of my favorites. Tell me about mm -hmm. you. What, what experience? What happened with um with India Irie? Um, with India, I uh I was just a a, a fly on the wall um for that. That's when I was an intern at uh, Hidden Beach Records. And so uh, it was actually, that was my first experience with uh, Dave Pensado. So um, the group Kindred, the Family Soul, they were mixing their record. And uh, there was a song they wanted India on, so they called her. And Dave was mixing their album. And uh, it was, I think Ariel was his assistant at the time. But, um, or maybe it was Jason. I don't know, but uh, no, it was Jason. It was Jason, and uh, yeah, they called India. She came to the studio, and I was just literally sitting in the back with a camera, um, just taking pictures and watching everything that was happening. And they just ended up cutting her vocal right there on the spot and threw it into the song. Um, but that was kind of cool. Like that just reminded me that was my first time meeting Dave and sitting in the studio uh, with him. What did you learn as Mr. Fly on the Wall? <laughs> uh, 
Man, it was it was it was my first time because uh, I literally had just moved here, um, so it was my first time being in a professional like full out mix. So just uh, just as far as you know, set up and um, getting everything ready for like Jason was you know kind of going through prepping everything for Dave to come in and just work his magic, and um, it was a lot, a lot of just prep stuff that I didn't know. You know, because you learn stuff in school, but you don't really understand it until you get out in the field. So just the mix prep, like I learned a lot about that and the editing and all that that needed to go on. Because I was literally, I think about, I've been out here three or four months. So I was a baby. We have a lot of people who are just out of school who have no idea what you're talking about. So what are you talking about all this prep work that you were surprised about or whatever? Uh -huh. like, yeah, when you, I mean, when you get sessions, uh, you know, they're not together. Uh, and the way tracks are spread out and sometimes it's best to, you know, uh, consolidate stuff and, uh, you know, put, uh, put all those backgrounds down to a stereo track or whatever, your drums down to a stereo track, whatever, and, uh, you know, get it so you can just hop through the session easily and you don't have a million tracks open. Uh, and at the time, that was... That was brand new to me. I had no idea. So I sat there and watched Jason do all of that. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. So I went home that night and hopped on Pro Tools and was like, this makes my life so much easier. And so, of course, now that's the that's what you're supposed to do. But I didn't know that at the time. you have any assistance where you teach them that? Will you have them doing that for you? No, nah, I don't have. That's the thing, man. I got people asking to intern for me, but it's it's funny. Like I engineer so much for other people that I end up engineering my own personal sessions, and I don't really like. I'm always doing everything because I'm always doing everything for everybody else. So I never really had an assistant. So you one of them old people that don't like helping us youngsters out, huh? Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> never that. Never that. All right, Vladdy. We got Vladdy. He's joined the group. Um, Vladdy, tell us tell us about you. Tell us where you're from. And if you have a question, hit him with it. Can't hear you, Vladdy. You're muted. For some reason. Well, you're not muted, but I can't hear you. Yep, you're not muted, but I don't have any audio from you, bro. Nor do I. Can I get my follow-up in the meantime? Go ahead. See, um, see, hey, see, 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 didn't we tell you about him? Y'all yeah, right. Told you about him. <laughs> Go ahead. It, it, it's only going to get worse now that I'm a, I'm a little grounded. Um, you were talking about that people rarely forget that uh, you do multiple things, but um, you ever get, uh, uh, I'm guessing at your level, you, you may have run into um, payment or discussion of payment, or maybe you can talk about that, where you're being paid for multiple um, stages, being an engineer or producer, or has it always been an arrangement where um, you're getting one fee for all of your skills, much like an actor who plays multiple parts on a television show, let's say twins, doesn't get paid for playing two different characters, they get paid for who they are, just one person. Yeah. Um... No, nah, usually, uh, so like, for example, let's see, I did a Keisha Cole record uh, with Jam and Lewis. I engineered the record, so I got my engineering fee, but I also did the drums on the record. So as soon as my name goes down for a drum programmer, that's a whole different fee that you have to pay me as a musician. So then comes a whole different check from uh, Interscope. Like, they had to pay me as well. So it's just, you know, you, you separate them. And, I mean, if you if you come into the situation knowing you're going to have to do all of that, then you kind of work out a deal up front. Uh, but with this situation, uh, a lot of the time with Jam and Lewis, it would be I was their engineer, but uh, we would start working, and then Jam would be like, yo, can you – throw some drums on this, or can you do this, do this? And then after that, it becomes, uh, I'm already getting my engineering money, then it becomes a whole other thing where the label has to pay the musician and union and everything else. So 
Yeah, different different situations. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and and I, I had a different a little different question, switching gears a little bit. Um, I see by your Twitter timeline that you are a huge fan of technology. You shout out your Instagram video when you first went back. Uh, Back in September, um, you are uh, you retweeted the BBM when it first came to the iPhone store. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my questions run deep. Uh, what is the uh, piece of technology that has advanced your career the most? Uh, has it just been the messaging or communication with people, or has it been something in terms of hardware or plugin? Um, that's actually a really good question. Uh, I think the one that's helped me the most at this point has probably been, uh, I mean, software-wise, or uh, Twitter. Like, Twitter has brought me a lot of money, <laughs> like, since it popped up in mid-2000s or whatever. Like, you just go up there and you holler at artists. And, you know, your retweets get seen by random people and other people's followers, and then you end up getting a direct message from somebody. And I've linked up with so many artists via Twitter, like major artists. And it's just so random, and it ends up, you know, you end up building a great relationship. And whether they just hire me for engineering or they hire me for tracks or for work or whatever, you know, it ends up in a good place. Like Twitter is definitely a social media period is, you know, brought in a good chunk of change unexpectedly. I had a feeling it might be Twitter, so I had a pre-follow-up for that. Um, <laughs> how, how do you validate yourself? Do you just say, here's my body of work, here's a link to that? Um, and if someone didn't have that, um, what would be your advice to them to, hey, this is how I get, here's my work. Is it just that they have to make a demo? What, what's the link you send out to be like, hey, this is what I do? And how do you um, approach that? Usually, uh, I just I just send them to my website, uh, and my website is pretty basic. It's free. It's on Wix. It's through Wix.com. W-I-X. Uh, I'm not sitting here paying anybody to make my website. I do it myself, and just get the uh, domain forwarded through uh, GoDaddy, and uh, so it's six seven music.com. But it's it's pretty simple. It doesn't need to be super elaborate for you to see who I worked with. Here's some clips of the stuff I've done and just kind of keep it updated with the current projects I'm working on and have a contact thing in there. And then, I mean, once you go to that and you see the names and everything, you're like, okay. And then from there, if you choose to Google me or whatever else, you'll find what you need to know. But, I mean, it's, it's been some circumstances where uh, somebody questions whether or not I can do that genre, and then I have to throw together like a quick little... Uh, demo thing with some snippets of mixes or tracks I've done in that genre and shoot it to them, but for the most part, I have, I've only had to do that like once or twice. Just let your resume speak for itself. Yeah, I was just about to ask, what, do, what are you doing to switch it from Twitter to get them to paying you some money? Um, but basically, uh, who was it? I think Ryan West said something about something like the same thing, your resume does the talking for you. So those yeah. people who don't have a resume, um, when you didn't have a resume, what did you do? Um, I mean, then, let me see. So that was like early 2000s. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it was it was MySpace at that point. And uh, I, was, I was just constantly out there working like, Fortunately for me, like my first record, like say I moved, I moved out here in November 2004. By December 2005, I had worked on a record that was uh, in stores. And so from there, and then the next year was Jill Scott, and so it kind of just stacked itself up. So I never didn't have, you know, a resume. Like I went, and the way I got on that first record, I guess this will help. Uh, is I was at an open mic night, I met a producer, uh, and we just started talking randomly. He was at an open mic, and he was like, what do you do? I was like, oh, I engineer, produce, I just moved out here. He was like, oh, I'm looking for an engineer. He was like, let me see what you got. And so I go over, and uh, he tries me out. It works out. We end up doing like a little two or three year run, uh, 
and that's how we got on all those records. The Jill and uh, this joint called Unwrapped, where they take hip hop songs and flip them into uh, jazz records. But uh, what is that Unwrapped? Unwrapped. Yeah, I think we did volume five, four or five. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, we basically take like a hip hop song, like we took uh, Fat Joe's Lean Back and Fifties Twenty One Questions, and we took them and brought in musicians and basically flipped it into a jazz record, but still kind of kept like the hip hop feel. So I recorded and uh, mixed most of that album, which also I had enough credits on that to join the Grammys as a voting member on that first record. See, that's dope. Um, that's on YouTube where I can go check this out, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right, I have a follow-up question. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Did I interrupt something? Oh, no, no. Go for it. Yeah, I just had a question about the studios you work out of. And so my first question is, do you have your own facility? Like, you work out of your own space or you're really used to working in a lot of different facilities, like wherever the client tells you to go? Um, yeah, I kind of hop around. Uh, I mean, I have like a little mini setup, a little pre-production setup at home. This is an inbox. And the problem I always have like, till about two... Uh, your voice breaking. Okay, until about two years ago, I was working day and night, different recording studios. I fly interstate every other day to record at different recording studios. But then, like now in Melbourne, and I'm here for good. Like I've been here for two years, set my roots over here, and I have my own little setup. But the problem is, like, I'm really used to working at different recording studios. So how does it work when a client comes, like, comes up to you and tells you, I want to record my record. Do you provide a recording studio or no? Uh, do do I? A recording studio? Oh, um, I mean that that depends on their budget. <laughs> That's like a hundred percent a budget problem uh, or issue. Uh, for the most part, yeah, I tell them like I have a spot that I use. Uh, they're actually a member of the Pensado students, uh, Devin Stillman, his studio. Uh, I use his spot because he has a live room. He has a vocal booth, so I cut. Uh, I haven't used a live room yet, but I use a vocal booth all the time. Like that's where I go. He has pretty good prices, so that's where I go uh, cut most of my records. And then, so if a client contacts me about working and they need a studio to work out of, I I always recommend uh, Dev because he knows me. I know him. He knows I'm not gonna bring any madness through there uh, <laughs> since it's his private spot. We, and uh, yeah, so I, I I use that spot. But then I mean, you have other situations where the client, like Let Us See, will call, and she's on a label, so the label's going to cover everything. So they just basically tell me where to show up. And that, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, here it's nothing like that. Here there's no credit system at all. Nothing to recognize the engineer's credits. Nor is there a label who will call you and say, "Oh, we have this recording studio. We have this massive budget." So since I moved to Melbourne, all the calls I've been getting are uh, just clients who are like, oh, we have a budget of like $300 a day, or we have no budget at all. And these are musicians who've, who have made a name in the industry, and they, are, they should have a lot of money, but yeah, it's just really hard to you know, kind of negotiate a good contract. That's why I prefer working with record labels, but recently it's just been, everything is just changing over here. It's not that easy anymore. Uh, so do you have your own space, like recording space? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I partnered up with with another engineer, and we started a home facility. So I built it up because I've studied acoustics as well. So I spent about a year and a half getting the whole studio built up from ground up. But later on, it just didn't seem to work out. So I just sold the facility, and because a lot of the work I was getting was freelance work. Okay. So I mainly just went to do freelancing work, and just after a while, it was just like, yeah, I want to be in a place where I can call home. So I decided to settle down, settle down here. So at the moment, I'm freelancing, but um, I started an audiovisual company and starting a video production company as well. So planning on getting a new facility happening, but yeah, just wanted to know about that. Like, how do you deal with clients? Like when they come over and say. Oh yeah, I want like the client is the talent is there, it's all there. there it, there's potential of going somewhere, 
but they are like, oh, we just don't have the cash for it, or the labels like we are working really hard, we can only afford this much. So, right. what to do in those situations? That's that's what confuses me half the time. Yeah, that that funny money situation uh, that can throw a wrench in things. You just gotta, like I said, I got I can usually hit Devin. I have Devin, and I have another spot that I usually. Those are my fallbacks. They're really cheap, like lockout rates. And uh, like I'm like, take care of the studio, and we can figure out, especially if I believe in your talent, I'm like, we can figure out a deal where you can pay me or we can work something out. But make sure the studio is taken care of, and we can figure out the rest later. Perfect. That's, that good. yeah, relationship-based as well. So, you know, don't do that with everybody. Yeah. Thank you. No hey, problem. Jermaine. Real, real yeah. quick, what what does Devin have over there for a vocal chain? Um, I usually run. Uh, most of the time, Dave Hampton will let me uh try out some of his blue mics. Um, so the mic changes. Uh, but then I usually run it through. Uh, he has a Great River, uh, Mike Creek, and a Distressor. Okay. Um, I run it through there, and uh, but he has everything, man. He has API. I use a I use the API pre last time I was there. Uh, Focus right, Avalon, um, and then he has two uh, M77s, I believe, the purple audio joints. Uh, all, I, all I remembered was he had some good gear in there. Oh yeah, it's it's. Right. He got yeah. Devin has some really good stuff, man. So I try to. That's why I stay over there because it's quality. Analog gear. Like he invested some money in there, and the room itself is really dope. It's comfortable. Yeah. Relaxing, like you're at home or something. Exactly. I I, I told him his room was like a, a hug. Like I walked in, I felt like <laughs> I was being, being hugged, and I was like, wow. Yeah, man. Him and his dad did a great job, and Dave uh, Hampton helped build that as well. They did a great job on that spot. Um. Yes, they did. Derek. You had a question? Uh, yeah, man. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong. I've seen you got Grammy credits on the Raymond vs. Raymond. Yes, sir. Uh, was that actually for mixing, or did you produce on that? Or? No, nah, uh, I was an engineer. Oh, okay. Engineer okay. Um, yeah, Jimmy and Terry and the Avila brothers did the production on that. So uh, it was me and Matt Marin, who was the other engineer at Flight Time, uh, uh, so Matt cut some of the vocals, I cut some of the vocals, and uh, what else? And then like when we had to track out the actual tracks, uh, I did most of that because uh, the one thing I did learn in Flight Time, we pretty much did everything analog over there. There was no software synth, there was nothing. It was you track it out of the MP, then you got like ten keyboards in the room, so you just have all of them open and they run around playing a bunch of keyboards so you literally have to track out the track because they're playing it live from top to bottom. Nice. So yeah, that was a whole nother job within itself having to do that. They nice. were playing the MPC live too? No, nah, the MP was was programmed but uh, like if you listen to um, Mars vs. Venus on that album and um, Monstar and all that kind of stuff like you hear like it's it's a lot going on, and those guys are going in, and you got live bass in there, you got some live strings on there, live you got live guitar, and then you have the, the Vila Brothers and Jimmy and Terry running around playing keys from top to bottom, all the way down. I'd like to be a fly on that wall. It yeah, was, you keep nuts. you keep saying um, flight time. Would you clue people into flight time? Oh, so that's uh, you know Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, the guys that did like every Janet Jackson record ever. Uh, they used to be in the Time. They're uh, you know part of the Prince lineage in music. They're from uh, Minnesota. They all went to middle school and everything with Prince. But uh, yeah, I worked there. Like I said, with uh, with Eli, he was up there for a while, and um, I was an engineer programmer out in uh, Santa Monica. And how serious were y'all as far as having to be stiff? <laughs> in what way? 
I just heard something about y'all having fun, like it was a fun environment or silly people. Oh yeah, yeah, man. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, once you reach that comfort level with people, you know, you go in and have fun. So we would uh, we would work. You know, we get the work done, and so when we get done around two or three in the morning, uh, Jam might be knocked out sleep. Me and Terry would run back in the lounge and be playing NBA 2K for the next two hours. And then we go home and do it all again the next day. Uh, some days we wouldn't even we would come in and we wouldn't even work. Like we would just sit around and listen to records. And uh, it would be kind of dope to sit there with Jimmy uh, and listen to him um, talk about. Like we would listen to uh, Rhythm Nation, like the whole album top to bottom. And he would sit there and tell me what keyboard he used on which song and how they made that song and the concept behind it and, you know, all that kind of dope stuff. Like, there would be days like that where you just come into work and you basically just got schooled on how classic records were made. And so old guys like you don't want to show us young guys <laughs> uh, stuff Never like that, that, huh? Never uh, said that. <laughs> they have... Uh, I, I keep hearing them talking about the kick it factor. Did they go over the kick it factor with you and what that means or whatever? No. What's that? Um, the, it, it was on an it was on a couple of interviews where Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were saying if they can't kick it with you, they don't want to take on your project. Oh yeah 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 okay that makes sense yeah I didn't know they called it. yeah so um, when when we worked uh, you would come in and we would sit down and talk. Like, there would be no, you come in, and we immediately start working. Like, we would sit down, and uh, I kind of became like the, because for a while, for a minute, it was just me, Jimmy, Terry, and uh, Carla, one of our writers. And so we would all just sit in the room, and me and Carla would kind of be like the invisible two, where you don't necessarily run your mouth the whole time, but you just sit there, and the artist feels comfortable. And they just talk, and they just you know, talk about how their day was and what's going on. And Terry knows how to get stuff out of people without feeling like he's prying. And so you'll, uh, you know, get a feel for that person and, you know, their attitude and how their day went, how their life is going. And then the song that you create would be based around that. So if there's, yeah, if you can't kick it and, you know, and, they can't get a vibe from you, it's going to be hard to create. Then it's going to feel like you're forcing it versus, like, I think they told me with uh, Janet when they did the Control album, it was on some, um, like, they went to the amusement park, they went and hung out, like, the first two or three days before they even started recording anything or writing anything. And Janet was like, what are we doing? Are we going to work? And they're like, nah, let's just go have some fun. And then from there, uh, the Control album was made because they... They hung out with her, they knew her, and they were like, I I can write a song for you. And so they came back with control because she was like at that point in her career or her life where, you know, she was trying to get away from her parents and not get away, but like, you know, so that she was an adult. And so control, I can do what I want to do. That so saying like I'm grown up now. And so they wrote that for her, I believe. Uh, I think it was just Terry and Jimmy that wrote it. And uh she was like, Wow, like that's exactly what I've been telling you guys like this is perfect for me and that also helps create a better record because the artist feels like they're a part of it. like you really got a part of them so their performance on the out on the song when you recording will be amazing because it's coming from them you know what I'm saying and do you do that absolutely I was gonna give you a shame on you bro no 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 like that <laughs> <laughs> that that experience was like I went to full cell I consider that preschool compared to sitting in with Jimmy and Terry. That was that was school, like sitting in there with them every day. Even if I'm working, you know, I don't sit there and ask a million questions. Like if you just sit there and you're the cool guy in the room and they feel comfortable with you, they'll start to tell you things and you'll start to learn a ton of stuff and you never even had to really ask. But it got to the point where if I had a question, I could ask and they would answer it. And I like even now I'll text Jam. If I'm listening to a song that they did, I'll be like, what keyboard did y'all use on Ralph Tresvant Sensitivity, like, to get the pads in the back? And he'll be like, oh, it was this Roland sampler, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, never, I'm, I'm not a fan of, uh, like, while we're working, like, if you're in the room, 
asking a million questions. Like in this forum is fine, but like if we're working, just sit back and watch because your questions generally get answered as the process plays itself out. Like you don't have to sit there and ask why I did this because you'll see in five minutes, oh, that's why he did that, so he could do this. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I, I did with them. Okay. And Vladdy, you had one? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. All right, perfect. So first of all, it's good to see everyone. Uh, hi, Tremaine, and thanks for your time. So hey, you, you guys have been talking about attitude and, and uh, mood. So when when you're nobody, basically, how do you how do you start out uh, attitude-wise when you're nobody? It, you uh, you touched on that by saying you don't speak a lot, but can you expand more on that? Um, as from from what perspective, as the engineer or the producer? Oh, as an engineer. Engineer. Um, the thing I think the thing that has gotten me the furthest in my career is like I'm the cool guy, like the cool engineer that doesn't. I don't say too much, but I say just enough. Like I'll throw a joke in there, but it'll be a tasteful joke, and uh, you know, kind of just filling out the room. Like that's really you have to develop a sense to kind of fill out the room and see what the vibe is and know like okay I can talk a lot with these people or maybe I should just shut up and and work because there's some situations where you're not supposed to be the cool guy you are they strictly view you as the engineer like I did a session uh, three weeks ago where I walked in and I was just the engineer nobody wanted to talk to me nobody like they just you were work for hire, do your job and shut up. And so you have to kind of fill that out and know your role. So I wasn't going to walk in there and be all super friendly and then everybody's looking at me like, why are you talking? So you kind of, that's on you to, to fill out your role and, and kind of fill the room to see, okay, I can, I can talk a little more. This producer is a little more comfortable versus this artist is a jerk. I'm going to just shut up and press record and do my job. And, uh, I had this situation recently. So, um, uh, in one of the hangouts we make, the the guys were organized here. I met uh, an engineer from from the city I live in, and he invited me to just uh, invited me to his studio. I was supposed to spend one hour there, and uh, things happened so that I spent four hours there. had a had a blast, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's just it, it was a great time. Uh, it was my first time seeing this engineer live, and uh, in the end of our uh, endeavor, I I sort of hinted that if uh, he needs help, he he doesn't have an assistant, he doesn't have anyone helping him. But I I told him if he needs help, I hinted him to call me. And now um, I'm in I'm in this sort of situation that I I wanted to ask you, is it okay if I don't uh, don't ask too much. I don't call the guy uh, every time I, I know he's in a session and, and just wait for him to call me. Or is it uh, is there another way to get myself involved? Um, yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of touchy, and it depends on the person because it's some people like like I like to be reminded because I I like I forget a lot so. Uh, yeah, I like to be reminded, like, oh yeah, you did say you wanted to come. So like the last couple of sessions I've done, I've I've invited people because they, you know, they constantly they're like, hey, when's the next time you working? You know, and I'll I'll invite them in, but uh, it just depends on the person, man. I can't even really, I don't want to give you a definite answer and say go do this, and then he's like, why are you bugging me? So it it depends on the person. Uh, you kind of gotta it's this music stuff, man. It's all vibe based. Like you kind of have to just. Fill, fill it out. Like, there's no definite answer. So he might be the type that's like, I know this guy wants to come to the session. When I have a session that I can bring him in on, I'll call him. Because, like, I can't bring people in on my legacy sessions. Like, she's not going to have that. But I can bring them in on my artist sessions or whatever else, you know? So it depends on that. So I wouldn't bug him, but, you know, I'd check in every once in a while and, like, once every two or three weeks maybe and be like, hey, uh, you got anything new coming up you need some help on? 
know what I'm saying? Kind of just kind of play it back because you don't want to get on his nerves, and then he just stop talking to you all together. Yeah, I like a that. female. Yeah. <laughs> you mean like? <laughs> yeah, like uh, uh, in a week or two. Something like that, one a month or so. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'd say like. Uh, well, when's the last time you talked to him? Um, I think it was a week ago. Uh, so something like that. Okay, so I I'd, I'd hit him in like if you had a week go by, probably hit him in like towards the end of this week, and just be like, hey, what's up, man? Just just checking in. Uh, you know, trying to get in and uh and learn. You know what I'm saying? Or just be there to help, be a fly on the wall. You know what I'm saying? Just, just kind of check in with them, but don't, yeah, don't, uh, don't hit them every time you see them in the studio, because then you turn into a bugaboo. You don't want to be that. <laughs> no, I thanks, man. Oh, for sure. And you're saying, uh, Brady, you? oh, saying no, that he no. had, um, he called you back, and you're not calling him back, or you're saying you keep calling him and he doesn't call you back? Which one? Um, well, after we met, I wrote to him once, just uh, casually, not uh, uh, not about uh, sessions or anything, just casually, and that was it. And uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't haven't spoken anything about uh, a recording or uh, assisting. It was just a uh, well. I will elaborate on that. So you guys, last time you guys saw me with this uh, drink. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> we were just talking yeah, about your drink yeah. in the chat, but uh, we're going to let you slide on that. But go ahead. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? <laughs> All right. So yeah, I was basically uh, told, told, uh, told, told the guy that um, I have this present for him. It's a, it's a small bottle. That, that, that was it. <laughs> that, that was my... <laughs> No problem with that. People like presents. That's one way to get in the studio, right, Jermaine? Yeah, absolutely. That'll do it. <laughs> do you like presents like that? <laughs> you say you got a gift for me. I'll be there. Right. <laughs> Come right over. <laughs> you better make it Patron. <laughs> exactly. What is, what is this? Hey, Bill, what was that one we were talking about, that cheap stuff? Um, Which one? We were this? talking last week or something about some real cheap alcohol. Um. What do you mean, West Coast or East Coast? West Coast. I, I can't. Uh, Y'all drinking that Mickey yeah, stuff. That's what I remember. That was Mickey's. That was a different color. Cisco, never mind. Like, oh, you, oh, no. Try that's, to, yeah, yeah, try that's to come bring Cisco. you some Cisco yeah. talking about I got the alcohol. That's Cisco, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, you better bring the good stuff. Um, or, or, like, you, you'll hear stories about guys bringing, like, green stuff to the studio just so they can get in. It's, it's the studio hey, stuff is crazy. Yeah, you gotta get your foot in the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we have Dwayne. Uh, well, yes. Here, well, here no. I am again. Here we go. <laughs> you ain't never lie. You ain't never lie. You ain't never lie. I have two questions. Both go for probably it. need long ex explanations. All um, right. But as I look through the resume of what you've been through, um. You got some credits in television. I got some of my first credits in television. Cut to that. Um, what was your uh, What was your experience in doing um, the stuff album wise for the artist versus the stuff that you're doing for TV, um, specifically uh, Comic View and uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians? Yeah. Is that all just producing, getting that music out, or? Or uh, the more the the mix of the show. No, nah, that's more. Uh, the, and those are actually two separate things. So yes. Kardashians, Bad Girls Club, Real World, and one of other joints, reality shows. Uh, I do music cues for those shows. Um, so I'm just producing. You know, they want the the Katy Perry pop sound, but they don't have the Katy Perry budget. So they right. want a bunch of music that can they can lay under there as cues and you know have it playing in the background. Um, so that's that. And that's and I just send the tracks to them. Right. And, and how's that as a, as a career? Um, because a lot of people don't even know about that's an option as uh, right as an avenue. 
Um, <laughs> I just saw <laughs> this chat is hilarious over here. Uh, so no, nah, it's it's actually a, a decent source of income, um, and people people really I've been trying to tell people about it and nobody's hearing me. But if you got to think about this, I they use thirty seconds of music. Uh, on a track that I had sitting on my hard drive for four years that I never did anything with. Uh, and they ran that episode 40 times in a month. I get paid every time you air that episode. So it's a whole like stream of income that people don't tap into, especially on the urban side of things. Uh, kind of disappointing. But uh, it's... It's a whole bunch of music, man. And if you if you watch those episodes, you'll realize like every thirty seconds the music is changing. So there's plenty of opportunities for you to get in there. And luckily, my friend uh, that I used to intern with, he works at uh, one of these companies, so he lets me know uh, you know what kind of music they want or looking for. And uh, even if they're looking for a theme song, I haven't got one of those yet. But if you get a theme song, oh, you're good. You're like. Yeah, you'll be winning. So, <laughs> like that, yeah, sync licensing, man, that's a whole other beast outside of the music industry itself. Like the television and film world, so much money going through there, so much more money than the uh, music industry. So that's why I kind of hop around everywhere because if you just stay in the music lane and you're like, I'm only going to work on records, I'm only going to engineer records, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to go over here and so like with Comic View I was a Pro Tools operator so I was up in the control room and it was me and uh, Tom Holmes who's a broadcast uh, mixer and Tom does Miss America the Grammys, BET Awards Comic View uh, Tom does everything broadcast mixing so Tom is on the console I'm beside him on the uh, Pro Tools rig so my job was like I'm in the studio I just record the entire show from top to bottom and uh, that pays better than studio life like on some real stuff like the hourly on that and day rate is nuts compared to sitting in the studio and it's more fun because you're watching a TV show take place so and it's, and it's also more controlled uh, it's, a, it's a lot of options like a lot of things it is because uh, with television we're shooting, generally we shoot the whole season, uh, especially with BET, we shoot a whole season at once. So we'll come in and shoot two or three episodes every day. So once, after the first or second day, you have your template saved and everything's locked in. So next episode, I go open my Comic View template. All my inputs are already there, so I just hit record on everything, and then I let that sucker run. I mean... What? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're paying me to do this, really? The money rolls but, in with the hard work. Love it. Yeah. And be uh, before we get to Dwayne's next question, <laughs> uh, I have a follow-up. We get right back to you, Dwayne. We're not forgetting. All right. I, that's cool. Me, <laughs> before we get to Dwayne's next question, I just wanted to follow that up because from my side, being the editor who puts together the television shows, it costs a lot more to actually call up commercial to people who have done commercial music and say how much would it cost for us to use your song on our show versus getting somebody like Tremaine to actually do original music for that show. Like the money that he's getting, everybody wins. The production yeah. company wins, Tremaine wins, everybody wins compared to if you were to actually try to license music that's already made. Yeah, exactly. Andrew, you had something for him? Well, Dwayne had a... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Dwayne was up? Okay. Yeah, Mine's yeah. a different yeah. tangent. Bad, sorry, Dwayne. Dwayne. I, I cut off Dwayne. Sorry, Dwayne. Go ahead. Do your thing. Oh, that, no, that's cool. I, I completely agree. Um, I just... Um, as I'm looking through... This is a bit of a follow-up. Um, I'm looking through the career. You're giving back a lot through um, the... Ed, sorry, you're going to hear a baby in the background. My son's TV. Uh, you've been giving it back a lot for the NA. I can never say this right. NAACP. There we go. Uh, the Grammys and whatnot. And you now got to the point where you started six, seven music. I hope I said that right. Uh, what was the decision to 
you're giving, you're giving, and then you had to make um, your own company to do your own production, I'm guessing, in writing. How did you know when it was time to do everything under your own umbrella instead of um, doing it under your own name because you build up quite uh, a reputation and a, a brand for just you? Why the company? Um, because uh, I wanted it to be like it's it's more than just me. Like the I, I think everything I do is is more long term. So I'm thinking uh, six seven music. Like if my children want to get into music, hey, you can take dad's brand and run with it if it's already there. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm I'm just thinking like that, and I don't want it to just be me. Like I want it to be my company. So if I hire if I have a crew of engineers, if I have other producers signed to me, you know what I'm saying? It's not just Tremaine Williams. It's we're a family. It's we're all under six, seven music. Because if you bring people in, they want to feel like they're a part of this this big company and this big thing. So like if if I don't have a company, it's just come work for me. It's like what? Nah, you gotta you gotta have a name. Like Jimmy and Terry have flight time. It's not just I'm going to work for Jimmy and Terry. Like, I work for flight time. Like, that means something. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to have the same thing, have the company name, and uh, also, you know, tax purposes. You want you know, some other stuff going on. You want it all coming to you. So, yeah, business stuff. And does that speak to the future of that you want of, more than just your children, but you're building a team out? Is that what you're actively pursuing as well? Yeah, yeah. To what you're working on? Yeah, I have... Um, I have, like I said, I have an artist uh, working on her project. Uh, I have my my writing partner who I write most of my songs with. Um, I have another guy, uh, Love Logic, who like we just did a record that came out last week. Um, this guy called Noel Gordine, and so I got my whole team together. Like I have another writer and a singer. He's not officially signed to me, but I pretty much advise him on. The majority of his career, so he's part of the team. And so whenever I get calls to do work, like with Noel, uh, his record is like out at Best Buy, and you can go get it. It's called City Heart Southern Soul Plug. Um, so with him, I cut Noel's record in a hotel room because he was in town for one day. Um, so I show up at his hotel room with an inbox, backpack, laptop, get it in. Then I call my team, and I'm like, "Hey guys." Uh, so I only had time to cut his lead vocal. I need y'all like to come in and smash all these backgrounds real quick. So I, it's like, you know, Captain Planet and bringing in all the fun, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I call the squad, and they're at my uh, apartment. Like, by the time I get there, and we all in there cutting vocals. Because, you Noel, know, uh, it it's an independent uh, R&B album, so the budget wasn't that where I can just go hop in the studio right quick. So they all came to the house. I just have my team ready to go. They came in. They already co-wrote the song. So I was like, yo, come in. Let's cut this, uh, cut these backgrounds. So if you listen to the record, that's them on all the backgrounds, and they co-wrote the song with Noel. Like, and they, it's all under the 6-7 music umbrella. Like, they all, the whole squad, they're ready to go. It's good to have a team and a family. When you're saying you're writing, do you actually write lyrics, or are you talking about the music? Uh, Both. You can actually write a good sentence, huh? I got yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I credit uh, Jimmy and Terry. That definitely that helped me step it up. Terry is what we call a, a, a wordsmith. Like his writing is out of his world. So he actually took time and explained some stuff to you. Yeah, I mean, if I had questions, but for the most part, I, you just sit back and watch, man, because it's like he doesn't just write a song just. You know how some people just vibe it out and be like, I'm just right. Like, no, like Terry does research. Like, we come up with a topic or a, con uh, a concept, Terry will do research on that concept and, uh, you know, go to Wikipedia, go to, you know, whatever he needs to do to dive deeper into the idea of that song and he pulls out stuff. So if you go back and listen to the uh, Usher Confessions album, all the stuff that they wrote on there is not just like surface level writing like this is really like really good writing so it's you know and that's why their career spans so long they're not just doing like simple pop records they're doing like really great writing it sounded like personal writing 
Yeah. Like, like if you go through, you know how some people go through stuff and then they stop going through stuff so they don't have anything to write, write about anymore? Right. Um, so then he would, if he's doing that, I, I could see where he'd be able to come up with stuff. You know, you do your due diligence. I always thought most people just brought in new people with issues. <laughs> nah, man. I mean, he, you know, everybody has their personal issues, but he, like, he taught me that uh, you have to write enough that you basically, like, work that muscle every day if you write something every day to the point where if somebody comes in and wants to write a song and you're not, like, you haven't been through that issue yourself, it's so natural to write that you've been practicing and that muscle is strong enough that you can still write a song about a topic you haven't necessarily been through. You can pull that emotion out of that person you're talking to or or go read about it enough to write a song about it. You said pull that emotion out. What are you guys doing to pull emotions out of people? Like what type of... Like... Um, and that's just like the, the kick it. The kick it vibe is back to that. Like pulling that emotion out is sitting there talking to them and getting them comfortable enough with you where they start sharing parts of their life. But I and the other thing is they had their own studio so they could they weren't in a rush. They wasn't like an hourly like we gotta be out of here by eight o'clock. Like we can sit up in here until two in the morning and talk about how great your mother's cooking is. Like we it's just the most random stuff. But uh you talk to the artist and you, you get to know the artist and that helps you write a better song for that artist. And once it's written and you want them to emote do they just do the artists the level of artists that you guys deal with? Do they just bring it, or do you guys have you ever watched them actually work an artist to where they're trying to get that artist to emote? You know? um, for the most part, uh, they never really had to because uh, pretty much everything that came through there was a list and had been doing this for years. We had a couple of like new artists. But then it fell back on, uh, it would be more of a uh, pitch thing than it would emotion. Because they're, once again, they, they're writing this song based on what that artist told them. So that artist, when they start singing it, that emotion is already there. Like, they're, they, don't do, like they don't do the typical demo thing, where it's like, we wrote this song, you come in and sing it. So there's never a time where the artist just has to come in and basically follow the template. It's like the whole process is very organic so they never really that kind of cancels out the whole you aren't emoting because you were involved in the process of this song so you're naturally going to emote every time all right Andrew hey guys hey Tremaine uh, nice to meet you man you too man um, so uh, I've just been reading the uh, UAD uh, blog recently and you've just started doing stuff for film um, are you skilled? Uh, are you trained in classical score or anything like that, or are you just coming from you know uh, a vibe feel? And how does that interact with you writing for film? Um, well, I've done one film so far, uh, and I have two on the table right now. <laughs> and the first one, uh, I'm be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> I ain't going to lie and be like, oh, it was, you know, I, had, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and if you go back far enough in my Instagram, there's pictures, like, me and the director are sitting in my manager's kitchen uh, with my Phantom Pro Tools and some KRKs. I just took my stuff over there, and, like, I'm looking at the director's laptop while I'm scoring the film. Like, right. a lot of it was done like that, just, I mean... It was the director's first film. It was everybody's first. And so we were kind of just, you know, feeling our way through it. Um, but now, at this point, after I did that, when I, I go back and listen to it, I'm like, eh. And now I've been studying score since then. Uh, I am, like, you know, I do know music. Music theory, I took piano lessons uh, starting at seven. But uh, knowing the instruments and all the instruments' ranges and all that, like, I'm... Like, that's what I'm in right now, learning that. And I just did, uh, like, through the Grammys, I was able to sit in a scoring session at Capitol Records for the uh, TV show Revenge on ABC. They have a 22-piece orchestra that comes in, and they do cues every week, every weekend at Capitol. So 
they allowed me to sit in and it was on some fly on the wall. I literally just sat on the back couch and just watched everything in front of me from like the Pro Tools guy over here to the composer uh, in there directing the orchestra, two engineers, uh, the composers, three assistants, and I'm like uh, the orchestrator like learning everybody's roles trying to figure this out because I'm basically starting from scratch in this world. Like this has, this is so far different from the music industry and the recording industry. This is a whole other beast. So I'm literally like a baby in this thing trying to learn it. But I do want to learn it because I don't want to be that, like how I look at people that are beat makers and I'm a producer. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I produce records. You made a beat. But like, hey, I don't want the composers to look at me as a beat maker. Like you just came right, in yeah, and tried yeah. to do this and didn't try to learn. So I'm trying to actually learn this and figure this out. So I'm, you know, I'm studying composers and everything else, figuring this thing out. Cool, man. Um, how are you finding that seeing that is affecting the music you're writing separately for commercial release? Then are you finding um, yourself going more, you know, with orchestral backing or adding more strings to stuff or just the general way you structure work now is it changing because you're researching this uh, I think it's affecting it's it's uh, definitely strings and just learning you know because I'm learning new instruments like I never really had to put a trumpet in <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I, in soul music a lot of the times you'll hear horn hits or whatever but most of the time, like in soul records, you hear French horns. That's like our thing. Yeah. Like I don't know why, but uh, so I, you know, I'm familiar with those. But having to get everything else, and you know, usually with strings, you just do a string patch, and it has all the strings in it. But now yeah. I'm going through and individually, I'm like doing the cello by itself, then I'm doing the violins by the, you know, what I'm saying, and building a string section within so the track. Him- more complicated in essence, and you're getting a bit more depth in what you're writing. You feel yeah, like. and it, it but it gets yeah, but it has your stuff sounding better in the long run. So I haven't put anything out since I've since I started learning this stuff, but it's definitely enhancing on the production side. I want you to uh, start a trend by taking uh, other bassoons or piccolos and just dropping them in you know R and B tracks. <laughs> wait, wait, you know, uh, Jam always puts a freaking uh, oboe. I didn't even realize it's like in the Keisha Cole record we were doing like he just whipped out the oboe sound on the key. I was like, what? And then like if you listen to like some old Mary J stuff, like he run he goes on the oboe, like on the keyboard. And I nice. was like, What? Who does that? Only you, sir. But it works. <laughs> it definitely works, but the first time he did it, I was like, Why is he playing with the oboe sound right now? Do you um do you think you'll I don't know much about your tracking history, so apologies if I uh, get into this wrong. But do you find yourself wanting to record more live strings and more live instruments from learning this? So, like tracking, you know, four-piece like strings and brass sections, as opposed to using samples and patches now. Oh, I would love to, but uh, these budgets don't love to, so that's probably not right. going to happen. <laughs> uh, fair enough, man. Yeah, the the string unions, the well, the musicians' union, especially the string players. The money you have to spend to get live string players in, oh man, no sir. <laughs> uh, fair enough, man. Get yourself to a, uh, you know, I suppose there's some great music colleges out there wherever you're working, and just get, you know, the top guys. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about doing that. I might actually have to end up doing that because I'm not paying these string players. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the money for that. <laughs> cool, man. Cheers. No yeah, sir. <laughs> and uh. We'll- have you have you have you thought about games as an actual? Because uh, it's obviously a huge industry, but I I I tend to see a lot of engineers, a lot of musicians, but most of them don't are not not really interested in the games industry. Are you Tremaine? Are you interested in that? Um, I haven't gotten that far. Like I think once I figure out this uh, scoring situation. <laughs> uh, then I'll look deeper into orchestration and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, you know, I, I play video games, so it's definitely on the record. But, uh, like I said, I'm just a baby in this, and I'm still trying to learn as far as orchestration and everything else goes. So I haven't even jumped that far ahead. I'm just trying to, you know, this next movie I have to start on, I'm I'm trying to get to get through that. So, but, I mean, it's definitely on the radar. Uh, and I'm around 
as being on the board of governors uh, at the Grammys, I'm around some really dope uh, composers. Uh, this guy, Christopher Tin, I believe he's done a couple of games, and uh, Chris Walden and uh, Chris Leonard's. And so uh, it's a good amount of composers in there. So when I get to the point where I want to dive deeper in, then I'll, you know, contact those guys, and I'm sure they'll show me the ropes. See, I was just about to ask you if you knew Jeremiah Wright, um, because you, because of Dave Hampton, um, he kept telling me about Jeremiah Wright and his orchestra strings and. Oh, Benjamin. Who did I say? Jeremiah Benjamin. Uh, yeah, Who the world is Jeremiah about. Wright? I, Benjamin, I don't know. Wright. <laughs> Benjamin Wright. Yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah, First I, don't, I said Michael Jordan and switched it to uh, Michael McDonald when it was Michael <laughs> Bolton. Uh, I don't know where I'm at, man. It's uh, okay. You just got back. But yeah. Uh, um, do, well, do you do you know Benjamin Wright? I don't. Like he's on the list, man. He's on the list. Uh, he's so dope, especially you know all the Michael Jackson stuff he's done, the Justin Timberlake stuff. Like, dude is killing. Like I just want to like for these sessions, I just want to be a fly on the wall and just just watch. Yeah. So I'm sure it'll it'll happen uh, when it's supposed to. I don't rush it. I have not been a fly on the wall on anything. Oh man, I'm about yeah. That's I'm about to start trying to be a fly on the wall. They're gonna they'll call me Mr. Fly. I'm so fly. <laughs> um, I'm <so> fly. <laughs> but yeah, I'm about to start trying to be a fly on walls where I can um, you know just sit there and absorb. And I'm always telling people. To do that, um, as I'm out trying to figure stuff out and teach, uh, but it, yeah, it's my turn to run around and 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 infest these studios with my presence. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Um, somebody else had a question, and I can't. I think it was was it Derek? By staring in the flies. Yeah. Um, staring in the flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this might be going a little off direction, but um, we all know you're a, a big UAD plug-in user. Um, you talk a lot about what you use on your interview on the site. Um, since that interview, is there any of the new stuff that you're really finding useful or that you really like, or have you tried any of the, the newer, like the Fairchilds and all that? Yeah. Um Actually, I, I really like uh, the Fairchild. I'm a, well, I'm a Fairchild fan anyway. I was using, I don't even think I'm supposed to say that, but uh, <laughs> I was using the other people's Fairchild uh, for a minute. Um, but no, nah, I, I really like, Fairchild is probably in all my mixes uh, at this point since I got it. And uh, the Ocean Way uh, uh, plug-in, I like that. Um, I've used the what is it the soft tube I believe the uh, bass amp. Oh yeah, the amp room. Yeah, yeah, amp room. Yeah, uh, I've used that a couple times on some uh, gospel stuff, uh, and I just got the uh, what they put out the six ten and the dangerous yeah. stuff. So I'm still playing around with that right now. I don't really have an opinion yet, but uh, yeah, I mean, I you know they keep impressing me because I don't know that any of this stuff is coming until I see it in my email, and I'm just like, holy crap, y'all just got dangerous? Yeah, that was <laughs> what? A surprise for me. Yeah, I, I didn't know, so it it surprised me, and um, I mean, even the like the Apollo Twin, I'm gonna grab one of those. That I'm like, you guys are really really killing the game right now. They're doing a great job. Yeah, everybody's buying those. That might be my excuse. Uh, remember what I said happened, Tremaine? Get that twin. <laughs> I'm telling you, get that twin. That might be my excuse <laughs> for getting the twin. I don't know that any of this stuff is coming until I see it in my email. And I'm just like, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm on UAD also. What are you using the uh, Fairchild for? Um, I usually use it on... Uh, Background vocals, uh, sometimes on bass. Um, what else? I kind of just put it everywhere, man. Like I really love the Fairchild. Uh, what are you noticing that it does? 
Uh, it's kind of, it's like, it's the glue for me. I usually use it on, uh, like, if I'm sending, if I'm busting all my backgrounds to, you know, the aux, uh, it's there. And it kind of just brings everybody together where they need to be. Like, it's, yeah. What about it on the bus? I use ATR-102 a lot. Um, what do I use on that? Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm scrolling through their plugs because, honestly, they have so many plugs that I can't use them all, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, y'all got like five 1176s at this point. Like, what the heck? Right. Yeah. So I can't. I haven't even had like a shootout with all the uh, 1176s yet that they made. Um, Do you have a particular uh, two bus chain that you usually use, or it just depends on whatever's going on with the record? It really depends. Like, I yeah, like that's the other thing I've realized. Um, I don't really have a template as far as when I start working, because one day it'll be a gospel record. Next day, uh, like before we started, uh, Ma was listening to this little folky John Mayer type thing I did, which is totally different than anything I've ever done. It was my first time doing a record like that. And um, any template that I would have had before would not have fit that, that album. I did that whole album. So I kind of just don't even, I walk into each mix with like an open mind and just kind of just go for it, just try out different stuff, uh, whatever works, honestly. You know. and there, are there any go-tos that you kind of end up using pretty much a lot? Yeah, definitely um, that EMT plate verb uh, that the UA has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that thing is amazing. It is, it is so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> that and... Um, the fat soul uh, on a lot of stuff. Uh, usually throw my vocals through the, uh, the studer. And um, what else, what else, what else? And then some, some wave stuff here and there that I won't mention. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you use them, but you won't mention them, huh? I'm, I'm just trying to keep UA happy. Uh, <laughs> I keep you uh, endorsement. Uh, uh, endorsement. Uh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and what does the studer do to the um? What does the waves studer do to the uh, vocals? Oh, I don't use the waves. There is no waves studer, is there? <laughs> I mean, it might. I, I I'm use messing UA. with you, bro. Nah, oh, I, like, <laughs> I use the UA one. I don't know. Yeah, I'm messing with you because you UAD. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, but no, nah, there is no wave studio. They have a J thirty seven. Yeah, that's why I said wave studio. <laughs> no, buddy. Uh, nope. Now nah, I'll run the um, like with the with the joint you were listening to the uh, Shani uh, album. I pretty much ran all her vocals uh, through uh, the studer, and it just this warmth. You know, it's about as close as you're gonna get to analog tape without analog tape, so uh, it gives it this warmth, especially for that album, it was so, like John Mayer, like very organic-ish, so it needed that warmth in there, so it definitely, it, uh, you know, it did that for her vocal. And I'm sitting here dying to ask you which Waves plugins you use, but I'm not going to ask you that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it's not even like deep ones, it's like, you know, Arbox and stuff like that, whatever. Yeah, well, our box is dope. Our box is yeah. dope. Who else? Who uh, had a question next? Hi, me again. <laughs> this is my final question. You, might, you mind? You mind if I get one in there? Uh, I got, I got one more, and then I gotta run off. So. Uh... <laughs> okay, go ahead. Do your thing. Do your thing. Then Eli. You never lie. You ain't never lie. All right, Mr. Williams. Um, what up? You graduated 2004. And I just wanted to know, you, you've been at this, well, from the date of your graduation, we'll say, what's now, two, five, 10 years from the graduation, um, is there anything that you would go back and tell graduating you, hey, you need to know this, or you're going to do this really, really wrong, do this instead? Um, 
I you know what? I, I would I would just say uh you know get ready for the bumpiest ride of your life. Like I mean cuz there's nothing like I could have I'm glad I went through everything I did cuz it makes you appreciate what you have later on and it also teaches you what you don't need to do in the future. Cuz the only way some of this stuff the only way you're going to learn it is if you get burned. And once you get burned it's forever in your memory versus somebody telling you you shouldn't do that. This is like your parents telling you not to do something. You're like, whatever. And you're not gonna learn until it happens. So you're like, I will never do that again. So like I would just I would really just tell myself, get ready, because this is about to be crazy. Like, and that's 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 all you could possibly tell somebody. Oh, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to watch the rest of this on my iPod. Uh, but everyone a good good day. <laughs> oh, like time zone. That ah, works. <laughs> See you, Dwayne. See you later, Dwayne. See you later, Dwayne. We, we like your questions, bro. Don't trip. We just, right. we just messing with you. <laughs> now get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Eli, what's cracking? Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, just a quick question for Tremaine. I know you say you, you have your own artists you're developing. Uh, I know with the scope of how the music industry is, or you, is your approach more of an independent approach? And if it is an independent approach, are you are you creating demos to shop to a major, or are you uh, putting a whole record out as our EP, or you know, or do you have a marketing plan? Like how what is your approach to uh, your own independent artist, your own new artist? Sorry, you know, your uh, what is your approach now in this, in this kind of scope of the industry? Yeah. Um... That's a good question, man. Uh, yeah, it's I'm it's it's on some do-it-yourself, independent. Uh, I'm definitely uh, handling it that way. Uh, I would, I mean, there's there's distribution situations I would go after, but um, I would I'm not I wouldn't take the label route at this point. It's just not. I don't feel it being worth it, especially in this genre of music. Like maybe if I was doing more popular music, but like I really just love R and B, which is why I'm doing this record. Because clearly it's not for the money, because <laughs> the money yeah. ain't there. Right. But uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's do it yourself method. And then uh, my manager, she's been managing like in Dombey for so long, and they kind of been running it themselves. Uh, running the show themselves, and they got a major label deal uh, at Concord through Stax okay, Records, wow. and so wow. yeah, they kind of started from the indie level and I'm built worked it up. their way up. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I mean if I wanted to go and have the the major thing, I could. I mean, I have people to call, but it's just I just can't see it. You know, nobody at this point in the industry is. Like if Faith Evans were to try to go get a major deal right now, I don't think it could happen. No, you, I, I see what you're saying, and I guess you are you are correct. Um, it's kind of it's just a different 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 time now, huh? but yeah. um, but I agree. I mean, you know, you can still make money, or do you think you can still make money then? You know, with these kind of uh, I guess you it's hard to say a subgenre because R&B to me would never die. I, I love R&B as well too, but. It's not right. popular right now, you know what I mean? So do you think you can still make a good living? You know, the artist can, can make a living, touring, you know, you still think yeah, it's yeah. okay. It's um yeah, I think so. And it's it would mainly of course come from shows and whatnot. Uh right. and then with the way we're doing it, like and you know this too, it's it's do it yourself. Like you don't yeah. have to hire the producer, you don't have to hire the engineer, like right. we're saving on cost on all of that. So your right. overhead is already super low. So right. Even if you sell only a thousand records, you kind of recouped already. That's like, a very good point. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause, yeah. and that's the good thing about knowing how to do everything and being good at it. Right. Versus having to go pay somebody, then you're stacking up budgets. Then you're dealing almost with a major label situation where you never recoup and you never see royalties because you were so far in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I see. What yeah, you're I mean, yeah, I think there's money to be made. I I just can't. You know. Unless you just have that magical, you know, there's always that that one magical record that drops the independent, like shit, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, 100 percent indie, That's like, true. and they are collecting stupid checks, and it's 100 percent independent. Like, it's always that one that'll pop through, and it might be you. You never know. So, yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, I hear that. Well, thanks a lot for the answer, man. Of course, man.
All right, we got a couple of uh, new people in. Joseph, introduce yourself. Nice introduction, Joseph. Yeah, Jason, yeah. <laughs> Jason, introduce, introduce yourself. Uh, all right, Jay Brown here from Atlanta. I'm a mix engineer and an instructor over here. Just kind of dropped in, um, just kind of listen and get some new information. I was listening on the YouTube side, but we're a little bit delayed, so I'm just trying to get my uh, get myself acclimated to the conversation. Nice to meet everybody again. What up? And Gavin, um, unmute yourself real quick if you're there. Take your cursor up to the top of the screen. You'll see a microphone. Click on it. It'll unmute you. I muted you because when you came in, um, it was a loud, okay. loud, loud, loud. Sorry, I had it off. <laughs> uh, uh, Jay Brown here from Atlanta. I'm a mix engineer and an instructor over here. Just kind of dropped in, um, just kind of listen and get some new information. I was listening on the YouTube side, but it worked. Okay, we're hearing a delay, playback so from Joe. Okay. Gavin, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. I was, I was letting the other uh, guy speak. You know what? Before you even introduce yourself, you know who you look like you're secretly. You yeah. look like you're, um, this dude from the industry that was just on the Grammys. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah, I get, I've been getting that for like the past year. But uh, yeah, my name is Gavin. I'm from Arkansas. I uh, recently moved to Nashville. I attended uh, SAE Nashville. And I just recently moved to uh, Columbus, Georgia. I'm not too far from Atlanta. But right now I'm currently interning for uh, Ben Allen at uh, May Studios, and I in, I do social media intern for uh, Tree Sound Studios, and I intern every Blue Moon for uh, DJ Burnwin, and also I do production with a friend of mine that lives in Memphis, and right now we currently work under David Porter, and we recently been just working under him, and Jimmy Jam's been giving us a lot of tips and info, and he's got to, you know, sit down with him and talk to him, but... Right now, I'm just, you know, interning, trying to be a fly on the wall and get in the industry, however I get it, you know, because I finally understand that you can't just keep all your eggs in one basket, so I just, you know, do whatever. So. See, I'm going to have to go and uh, re-watch this and uh, look at look all them names that you just threw up. Uh, <laughs> they might know all those names. I'm, I'm on the ignorant side when it comes to all that. Um, yeah, I've been listening and just listening to him talk about Jimmy Jam. It was just crazy because, like I said, my friend just called me and was like, I guess why I just sat down and talked to him. He was like, Jimmy Jam. And I'm like, who was that? So then he got to explain it and I got to research and I'm just like, oh, it's real. You get what I'm saying? But the only question I got for you is like, okay, like I said, I'm trying to, you know, just intern and far as I see how the industry is working far as engineering and, you know, mixing because I've been producing for so long. It's like, I want to get into like the film industry and television. Like, do you have any tips or just anybody in the room that do live in the Atlanta area? Like, where do I need to go, you know, to find like internships or to apply as far as you know to to get in that type of industry? Um, I'll say uh, like the the work that I do in Atlanta, I'm generally up at Turner, uh, over by mm -hmm. Georgia Tech, and um. Yeah, I mean, I, I do everything there. I mean, you could start there mm -hmm. and uh, and see if they have any internships uh, up there because they do so like, much. Do you have any tips or anybody in the so, room that do live? And so, uh, yeah, it's I, I'd start there because um, they do, like I said, they do our BET shows. Then they, they are doing NBA on, T, NBA on TNT, NBA TV, True TV, uh, MLB on TBS, uh, just Cartoon Network. Everything happens in that building. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I definitely try to get over there if possible. And, I mean, next time I'm in, in Atlanta, I think I'll be doing Sunday Best this year. So, uh, you know, I'll hit you up. You can come through and uh, come to some tapings. Meet some oh, I will definitely do that. And my final question is, and I just passed the mic, um, I know I went to SAE, and I know I'm just trying to beef up my resume right now, and I saw this uh, Pro Tools, like Pro Media Training. Like, do you think, like, just a personal opinion, do you think I should do something like that, like get a, a expert certification under my belt, you know, just for just for resume's sake, or is it really just about building relationships? Yeah, uh, nah. Personally, I wouldn't 
I didn't like because they gave us the option in full sale to get Pro Tools certified and all that. But like at the end of the day, for me, every job I've gotten has been a referral. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So and nobody is like looking at the paper as far as you know because if you go to All Music, you're not gonna see Pro Tools certified up there. Like nobody sees that. Like it'll and the stuff that you get from that, you can get that just at home. Like I, mean, I would go yeah. home every day on on my inbox and put in work and put in the hours. And I mean, I can't really say that it'll that it would have gotten me a job or I missed out on a job one is because it's everything is who you know. That's and not necessarily what you know. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just making sure. I mean, yeah, I trust me. I'm I'm off the chain when it comes to Pro Tools. I was just, you know, <laughs> making sure. <laughs> I was just making sure for resume's sake, cause like I said, like I'm from a very small town and we ain't got resources like that. So I'm just now come like I've been going to a lot of conferences and traveling, like even you know networking with people, and that's why I'm trying to make sure before I went ahead and spent that that five thousand dollars on, you know, is it gonna be worth it or not? Right. No, nah, it's um, yeah, I can't. I personally can't say it would have helped me at all because it's it's really referral based, man. You know. Okay. Cool. One thing about that Pro Tools certification, if I can jump in, um, like like he said, is you can learn all that stuff at home. Um, people like Turner. Um, I know when you get in there. I remember. I have a colleague that you still used to work with, Chris Nicholson. Um, Turner, the corporate people are looking for certification. All right, uh, um, the corporate people. So you know what we do in the audio world is totally different. I'm expert certified. Um, I, I think the last one I took was ten. Um, so I'm expert certified. That hasn't getting hasn't gotten me any more gigs than anybody else. Right? It has actually has gotten me one. And that one gig, I wish I would have never taken. Just because. <laughs> <laughs> right? right, one gig. Um, but the only thing I can say, just being like on the expert certified side, yeah, everybody's cool with Pro Tools. But I know, you know, I'll tell my students, I know Pro Tools. I know what Pro Tools is designed to do. And everybody knows, and here knows. Pro Tools likes certain things, and Pro Tools doesn't like certain things. And just the certification path. You know what Pro Tools likes and what Pro Tools doesn't like and how to stay away from that and how to troubleshoot. It's a more technical thing than, than anything else. So um, in that regards, um, I went to a school that, you know, offered it. Would I go Pro Media's way and go down to um, Stanconia um, and, and get that? Probably not at this point. But, you know, I have, you know, I was just lucky and had the access to get it. But it's good to have just because of, for your own personal sake, corporate wide, but like like um, Jermaine said, like you ain't gonna get it. Uh, uh, you ain't gonna go down to a Doppler and be like, hey, <laughs> right? <laughs> I got, I... <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Yeah, I appreciate that because I sure didn't know, man. Because yeah, that, that's why I said I was gonna try Turner too. Because yeah, my main goal is to eventually you know work for like TBS or USA or Cartoon Network. I mean, the audio industry is cool. It's just, I mean, I grew up been doing music my whole life. Like, I started off in the orchestra. Like, I played viola, and then I switched to bass, then I, then I was in jazz band, then I was in a punk rock band, then a reggae band, and, you know, doing hip-hop. So just now, I'm 27, and I'm just now intern. It's like, I'm kind of tired. You get what I'm saying? And it's like, I want to see something new, and I figured if I tap into the, the television or the movie industry, it's going to, you know, bring me something new and I actually get more inspired to do more things. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, just uh like I said, when I'm when I'm down there, I, you know, uh I'll definitely let you uh come through and you can meet whoever you need to meet to get in there and then uh like I know I know a good amount of folks I might be able to help you out like uh Dallas Austin's do Rick and all them kind of folks and JD's folks. So yeah, I um, you know, I try to help you out. I sure appreciate it. But, Make um, sure you get his information, Gavin. I'll 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 even uh, send you his uh, Facebook thing uh, to make sure you. Yes, Kendrick Lamar is who he reminded me of, Laddie. Okay. <laughs> hey, look, you go you gonna make me pull out the Kendrick Lamar video because I work at Paxton <laughs> Mall and I, I get it every day. So I mean, I'm used to it now. So it's all. Good. <laughs> 
You know what? I was um, uh, what was when when I had my gold tee, and, and I'm ball headed. Um, I forget the brothers in common. Common <laughs> walked on stage. Yeah. The Grammys, and when Common walked off stage, I was walking down the aisle, and bruh, I was not denying that I was Common when they said something. Hey, I, hey, I didn't I say yes. Yeah, Bro, I got a discount at Dillard's because they thought I was Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't, 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 you know, you might deflate somebody's, you know, fantasy real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely works out, though. <laughs> uh, did anybody else have any, uh, a, a question for him? Because I want to, all right, J-pop. Uh, tell me about your J-pop experience. Experiences. Um. Yeah, so I did two or three J-pop uh, joints. The first one was, uh, that was actually my second session of flight time, I think. Second or third was this girl named Tiana Chow. Um, and she came in, and she got some, like, really, really, really dope records from uh, Jimmy and Terry. And um, it was interesting because she's... She's singing them. She's she. I think she might have been born in America or something. Like she's very very smart. Uh, she was in college at sixteen. Uh, extremely intelligent girl, and so she spoke English clearly, but her Japanese wasn't the greatest. So it was interesting having to uh, have the translator in the room with us um, to make sure she was saying it right, and then. Uh, you know, we're we're sitting there because we don't know if she's saying it right, so we're basically aiming for when we're doing all our different takes, when we're about to comp, we're making sure the pitch is right and the delivery is right, but we don't know if the words are actually being pronounced right, so we had to have a translator sit with us while we comped to make sure, like, this is, like, clearly the word that needs to be said right here. And if not, we would have to pull from a different take, and then that take might not be exactly what you wanted because... The pitch was off or something else, so it was like a, a weird experience having that third person in the room telling you telling you and the producer you can't use that. And so it was interesting that was, that was with her. And then the other one actually did with Eli uh, Crystal K, who was like this huge pop star in Japan, uh, and I think she's moved to New York now. But uh, she was, I think Crystal was still a teenager um, at the time. And uh, like I said, she's like, she was about 10 albums in almost in her career. Like Crystal been cranking out records. And so uh, with her, she would do half of her songs in Japanese and the other half in English. She bounced back and forth. So uh, one of the records Eli produced uh, with his partner Julian, and then um, the other record uh, Jam and Lewis produced. Uh, so it was, I don't know, it was an interesting experience uh, working with them. And then the cool thing is uh, that I want to tell y'all, you need to develop these relationships with these artists, but don't, you know, don't come off like you're trying too hard, like you're trying to be their friend. But you just have to be friendly, and that's what gets me a lot of jobs, like even after I left Flight Time. Like I, I met Lettucey while I was working at Flight Time, but Lettucey calls me to do sessions with her all the time just because she likes me as a person. She knows my, I'm competent enough to, you know, engineer the session. But when it's like you have a list of engineers, all of them, you're recording a vocal, so it doesn't take an amazing engineer. So then it comes down to who do I want to be in the room with uh, for the next eight hours. And it's like, I want to be in with Tremaine because Tremaine is cool. That's the homie. It doesn't feel like work. We having fun. We acting a fool. But we still getting the job done. And so most of the clients, when I left Flight Time, I still talk to about... 90% of the people, uh, the artists, and I still get calls for work from them outside of that just because of my demeanor and being the cool guy in the room and not being the engineer that just sits there and presses record and is the stiff guy. So I wanted to tell you all that as well. Nurture those relationships. What What's cool is, is you'll think Jimmy Jam or Teddy Riley, uh, you think they're not working, they're going broke, and they're work, doing all this overseas stuff. Working their butts off. Yeah. I, I think uh, Jimmy and Terry did like one of the biggest selling Japanese albums in Japanese history. 
Like the money that came from that, no one even I don't I couldn't even tell you how much it was, but it was it was a stupid amount of money and it was one of the biggest selling records in that country's history. Yeah, big international. That's where the money's at. I had um I went and I, f I forget the girl's name. It was like nine, like young females, um, girls something, whatever it was. K-pop. All of them had different looks, and they were all they all had their act together. It. I, I said, okay, either this is sponsored by some billionaire type person, or this is sponsored by the government. That was my first impression. Because <laughs> um, I was like, they. It, it's 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 hard for me to get two people together. As a as a team and make them act right as a, as a group, Luke. And and there was like nine women, and you know getting you know like two three dudes together and trying to have them act right can be a challenge. Yeah. Nine women. That's that's amazing. And they they were all they were on it. I was like wow. And it was it was K-pop. And I mean they were just I was blown away at how how thorough how good these um artists were and how much money. You could tell was being thrown at them, and then and then you know I was told you know like I said Teddy Riley's doing stuff for him, um, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, all these people are there's there's major 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 people um, doing stuff for these people, and none of us you know we sit back here and not have a clue um, yeah. that this is going on. Yeah, so much money circulating over there. You um that um that picture I'm I was looking at on your Facebook of uh, Jill Scott. Relax and shooting pool. <laughs> Why you let her beat you playing pool, man? Hey, look here, man. Look. So, <laughs> number one, like that was that was my most. Uh, you know, how you had those sessions where you freak out before the session happens just because you actually know who the client's gonna be. Like that was the one for me. And so, uh, like Jill's first album is the record that made me go like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do for a living. Like this, I want to make music for the rest of my life. So like Jill in my eyes was like, oh my God, it's Jill Scott. And so uh, we finally get the, you know, the nod that we're going to do the session and me and the producer is sitting there uh, at a, I forgot what studio it was, but Ronnie Jerkins bought it now. But uh, we're sitting there at this Atlantis, Atlantis Studios in Hollywood. And um, we're sitting out there and me and him are just playing pool and Jill comes in and she's like, hey guys, can I play? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. She's like, I'm not that good. Next thing I know, she's like doing behind the back shots, and she just <laughs> hustled the shit out of me. <laughs> and I'm like, did I just get hustled by Jill Scott right now? Like, in the first ten minutes that I met her, she just played. And uh, first pins of Bel Air skit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Walk out in your drawers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how how did you deal with it? How did you get comfortable? Cause like. When I met DJ Burn, it's like, you know, you hear these names so much, and then when you actually get to meet them, you, your heart kind of flutters a little bit. So I got comfortable, but then he, because I actually got to engineer that session. So he was like, yeah, you're going to engineer for Scotty today. He's like an upcoming uh, Atlanta rapper. And then he was like, yeah, Killer Mike is going to stop by. And I'm looking like, don't tell me that. Come <laughs> on, man. Like, really? Don't do that. Yeah. Luckily, he ain't he come by, so I, I yeah, because Dungeon Family, so, you know. <laughs> but how did you deal with it, though, like, when you first met Jill Scott? Like, how did you get back to your comfort zone to realize, okay, she's just a normal person, and I don't need to put her on that pedestal like I did when I first heard her records? Um, I'm trying to think. I think it was the pool thing, man, like, because it was just, even with that, like, we didn't just get in and go straight to work. It was like we sat out there and played pool for about an hour and a half before we even walked into a control room. So it's just doing that, having fun and talking, and you kind of just, your nerves kind of uh, go down after, you know, sitting there talking. And then kind of just, like I said, filling it out and kind of you throw a joke in and see how they respond. You'd be like, okay, they got a cool sense of humor, so I can kind of mess with them a little bit and Luckily, Jill was such a cool person uh, coming in that uh, she made it real easy, man. Because same thing like with Janet, I, I about lost that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, are you serious right now? Uh, I probably got put out. I'm sorry. <laughs> nah, it was, 
it was, I mean, same situation. That one took like a, a solid day or two to adjust to that because it's just mega star and like literally since my childhood, like you have been a mega star. And so uh, that one took a minute and Jam kind of just threw me to the wolves because he was like, he looks at his phone, he's like, oh, Jan is here, go meet her at the elevator. And so I go to the elevator, she's not there, she's down in the garage. So I was like, well, I guess I'll go to the garage and get her. And then y'all haven't seen me, but I'm six foot seven, like I'm pretty big. And yeah. so, <laughs> so uh, like I'm on this elevator and she's waiting for the elevator to come. And, uh, and it gets, it's, I don't know, she gets on the elevator and she just does the slow look up like what is going on right now? Because she doesn't know me. She's expecting the elevator to be empty. And it's like the awkward conversation. It's like, hi, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and in my head, I'm just like, oh, my God, it's Janet Jackson. Oh, my God, it's Janet Jackson. And then after, I don't know. I'm that body. We're not even going to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you could have acted like you didn't know who she was. Man, nah, bro. You can't. Because like, when she gets in and she does a little Jackson voice, you just punk out. Like, you <laughs> she's like, hi. You just, oh, my God. So, <laughs> you, you got to, that one took like a day or two, but I think the way that one ended, I ended up like cracking a joke. And then I was like, oh, she got like a cool sense of humor. Okay, we can, we can run with this. And then from there, everything kind of leveled out. But yeah, usually I kind of break the ice by kind of filling them out and cracking a little joke. See how far their humor goes, but uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, still to this day, man, I, I'll freak out at certain sessions just because you know this is what you want to do. Like this is your dream. This is a dream job, and you get to work with all these great people. And the list just like I kind of worked with pretty much everybody I've wanted to work with. So anything at this point is just like a plus. And so being able to. You know, go in and I did some Grammy stuff with Kendrick Lamar. I'm a huge fan of his. So I was like low-key a fanboy for like two seconds. So, so you was part of the uh, Good Kid, Mad City uh, sessions? No, 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 no. I, uh, we did a, a Grammy thing. It's on Grammy.com. We did like this whole sit down with him and DJ Ski. And, oh, okay. Uh, gotcha. This whole interview thing. Yeah, and so I was in charge of all the audio that night. But I've been listening to Kendrick's album for a year at that point and then listening to section eighty before that. So I was like Yeah I'm a bona fide fan. Like I really love his music. So yeah, I'm on the for that uh on vinyl because you know they did a bootleg of section eighty. It's like three hundred copies and I'm trying to get that on vinyl right now. Really? Yes. Like they didn't T D E didn't put it out. Somebody else put it out. Oh okay, 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 okay. Yeah. So yeah. And you just so gonna that announce it. that on live show where everybody can see that you're looking for some <laughs> <legal> material. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, shout right. out to the awesome Dave Hampton over there. Hey, Dave, welcome aboard. <laughs> you know, we know you're new to the internet. You know, come on in, <laughs> make, make yourself at home. Man, I I was just I was just sitting down here listening to the future, man. <laughs> you know, very rarely do I get a chance to talk to the future, man. And that you guys are all talking to the future right here. Oh my God! Stop it, dude. <laughs> hey, this guy's at the top of the food chain, baby. Oh man, He's at the top of the food chain. No, oh, I've just been listening. I've been, I've been uh, checking y'all out from a distance. It's, it's doing good, man. I'm, I'm glad you're on here. Appreciate it. That um, you I. The Grammy camp, um, Tremaine, you had said something about Grammy camp. You, Dave, um, tell me about the Grammy camp thing. I've, I've never even been to one or anything like that where I've seen what goes on there. Okay. Um, so Grammy camp is every summer. Uh, it started, I believe, about, I think it's the 10th year anniversary now. Um, and so it started out as, uh, I think it was a two-week camp, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And now it's been reduced down to a couple of days. But uh, we get kids from all over the country. Um, they all have to send in audition tapes and, you know, tell us why they want to come to camp. Uh, there is a, a fee 
but um, a lot of kids end up getting scholarships. Like I think Bruno Mars just signed on to do five years, and he's going to send a kid to camp every year and pay for one kid's scholarship. Uh, but it's it's a all inclusive music camp. You stay on campus. Uh, well, they have it at USC. They have it in New York and Nashville, and I think this year they're doing Minnesota as well. And so, um, you know, you go in to camp, and you just they have different tracks. So it's like literally a summer camp where you go and you have your audio engineering students, your electronic music production students, your guitar, bass, drums, horns, uh, journalism, um, and something else. But they have all these tracks. And they have students in every track. And so they take the students, put them in groups. Uh, so you have different bands. And so at the end of camp, they have this showcase where, like, the audio engineering students have recorded the bands in the studio, uh, and the band might be playing something that the producer made. Uh, and then, you, oh, you have the singer-songwriter, so the singer might be singing. So, it's you know, everybody comes in at the end and collaborates, but during the day, you're in class uh, with all these teachers. Most of the teachers uh, teach at USC or they're various, you know, professionals in the industry, and then you have guests come in. And um, I know my first year there, I was a counselor for the engineering and music production, and our special guests were Donald Passman, who wrote, you know, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and the kids got to sit side by side with Earth, Wind, and Fire and run through, like, a couple songs. So we had, like, two drum sets. So the kids on one, Earth, Wind, and Fire's on the other one, and it's just... You know what I'm saying? You get these experiences that you would never get uh, anywhere else in life. So first year I was a counselor. Second year I was in charge of all the back, uh, back line for the camp, which was nuts. Like you have to get well over like two or three million dollars worth of gear for free, get people to give it to you, and then you send it back out uh, when you're done. But uh, it's a great thing. Like if y'all have any... Uh, because it's high school students, so if y'all know any high school students, uh, send them to GrammyFoundation.org, I believe, or Grammy.com, and uh, you know, try to get them to sign up because the experience is literally once in a lifetime. There's also another um, event like that through I Standard called B Camp. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, I went to B Camp last year, and basically it's similar to that. It's a, a three-day weekend. And it's like all the top producers at whatever particular time, they actually in there teaching you, you know, how to do production. And they got attorneys in there to teach you the business side. And they got a, a beat battle at the end of it. And, you know, of course, you know, your boy won. But, you know, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you learn from people like Justice League. And I know they did one out in L.A. So they had, like, DJ Khalil and, like, a couple of uh, Kendrick Lamar producers. But, yeah. It's definitely a fun event. They do it like they do it every year, and they do it like a tour. So, cause I'm gonna try to get on the tour next year, cause you know I I've been using Fruity Loops for like 14 years, and while I was at SAE, I was teaching students and teachers how to use FL Studio. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just uh yeah man, I, like I've I've learned like never stop trying to learn stuff. I mean, which is clearly y'all doing because y'all are here, but uh. I, I've seen like some of my friends. They get to the point where they stop trying, and they think they know everything. <laughs> like, and that's that's when you fail. Like, because there's always. I mean, it's, especially with technology now, there's literally something happening every day, something new. So you know, never never stop learning. Hey, I got uh, another question. Like, I know you produce like. Producer, beat maker. Like so many people call themselves producers, so many people call themselves beat makers. Like I'm at the point where I can't deal with people that just come come up to me and just want to be. Don't even want to know who I am, where I'm from. Like they don't want to build no type of relationship. Like how do some of y'all people in here deal with stuff like that? Uh, wait, ask that again. Like, you know, like, beat makers, they'll just ship off beats and they don't care who raps on it or if this person is even serious about music or stuff like that. Like, like I said, I've done music for so long. It's just, it's hard to find people that are actually passionate about their craft or actually study their craft, per se. And they just feel like just because they can put some rap together or they can 
sing with a heavy vibrato that they meant to be an artist. Like, how do you weed out all them people that are not serious as far as trying to shop your music with people that are serious? Um, I mean, it, that, that just takes time and learning the, uh, the warning signs of, uh, you know, what if somebody's being serious and are they just doing it to say. Because a lot of people out here, especially in L.A., is they're just doing it to say that they're doing it. And like I'm like, okay, you just treating this as a hobby, not as a career. But uh, yeah, it takes time to you know to after a while you'll be able to catch the warning signs. Like in the first 10, 15 seconds of the conversation, you'll be like, this is bull. Like you not about to catch any beats or any tracks from me at all. And uh, if you do, you're gonna catch some some D list throwaway joints that I really don't care about. Gotcha. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, it's definitely a headache. I, I was waiting for Dave Hampton to um, respond because uh, he no, has something where he's talking about don't waste my time. That's one of the worst things. No, I man, I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm listening to the future, man. You, <laughs> this you guy. don't play. You <laughs> don't play. Come on, OG. You don't, you don't want to hear what OG has to say because you don't play. Look here. I no. learned half this stuff from Dave. So. That <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, only thing I do is I, I know a lot of warning signs. So when we get together, Tremaine and I compare notes. So he tells me about the things he's seen. I tell him about the things I've seen. And then we just go, look out, duck, you know. <laughs> and it pretty much works like that, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he's got, it, he's got it on. You see the warning signs, you know. I think beat makers and, you know, that, that whole thing kind of brought on uh, a lot of people jumping on real fast trying to make a buck. So you have a lot of people who straight up will just sell beats for uh, X amount of dollars. And like they're really yeah. into that. And they're really into that. And so because they're successful at that, they don't really attach themselves to a love of anything other than selling their beats. Eventually, if something jumps off, something jumps off. But a lot of people are really stuck at saying, yes, I'm, I'm a this, I'm a that, you know, top of the bottom kind of thing. You know, and and that's okay for them. Um, beats give people the ability to participate, just like Fruity Loops, right? Fruity Loops yeah, allowed yeah. Fruity, Fruity Loops allowed a lot of junior high school kids to participate and and start making beats early on because it was a it was a very inexpensive program, and it, it was on everybody's mom and dad's PC, and they could just jump right on it and start making beats. So whenever technology kind of allows you to participate, you're going to have people who are really committed. And you're gonna have people who are really involved, and and if you don't know the difference between involved and uh, committed and involved, just look at bacon and eggs. Chicken lays the egg, wig go walks away and lays an egg another day. A pig gives up his life for that piece of bacon. So that's that's the difference between commitment and involvement. So does, if you're just gonna be laying an egg and walking away, come in and lay another one. Then you're probably just selling beats, and it's you know that that's where you're gonna be. But a lot of people give up a lot of things in order to do what they want to do, and they're committed. And um, and I think commitment's gonna get you a bigger reward. But you know nowadays, you know who knows what's happening in, in music? Who knows what's gonna be the the end thing? Right. You know, we're looking at we're looking at everything change right now in front of us. And and um, we, none of us really know the answer to what's going to be the next big thing. We wish we did, but we can't say. We can't say. We can only guess. We can only look at what happens or what the next event is or who the next freak is to jump out fully financed with marketing and uh, Internet scheme. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you know, and, that, and that's part of it, too. We, we never had that before. Before, if you were good with a drum machine, you were good with drum machine, and you just went to the studio, from studio to studio, record to record, call this cat because he's good with a drum machine. But now, if you're just making beats and you're good at beats, it's a different thing than being good at a drum machine. Yeah. Okay, because beats are shorter segments of time than the drum machine. You know, cats used to do whole productions. You know, uh, Jermaine Dupri's big entree in the music was because he was a... 15, 16-year-old that knew how to work an MPC, and it was all the rage, and you heard about him 
from Atlanta to Los Angeles to New York, everybody heard about him before they even heard tracks. They just knew there was a kid who knew how to work a drum machine, and he was killing. And that was his that was his calling card. So it's a different time, different era. I'm not saying you can't do it with Fruity Loops. I'm just saying there's a lot more people with Fruity Loops and Fruity Loops Studio, and that entry point is usually it, it's 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 kind of like a filter. You know, it filters out a lot of people. Some people will will be there and they'll lock in and they can really do it. Some people will they'll do Fruity Loops and then they'll give up. They'll do uh, some of these other programs, Reason, and then they'll give up. You know, they, they'll just go as far as they need to go because there's so many different ways people invest themselves now in, in our business. You know, we're, we're talking, I mean, how long, Tremaine, how, how long, I always ask you this, but I'm going to ask you in front of everybody. From the time that you went to school, how long has your career been? Uh, it's about to be 10 years. Ten years. Yeah. See how quick that is? That's a quick ten years. Yeah. <laughs> That's a quick ten. No, when I first met him, what was it? That was oh seven, oh eight. Right. Yeah. Right. So so time flies, man. Time flies. Then this this cat from from loving it to, to living it to studying it to being out there clocking checks for it. Ten years is a relatively quick run. It's a relatively quick run. And considering where you went when you left school, most people don't have that story. So you're already beating the law of averages. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, those are things to think about when you look about, okay, this is, you know, you got to look at where you're at and what you want to do, you know. I think if you want to do more than, than be stuck in Beatville, you you got to kind of plan it out and kind of start to communicate with people who are doing other stuff outside of that. I mean, it doesn't mean don't do what you do. It just means mix up what you do with some other people who are doing some other stuff so that it takes you into another arena. And then that way you get to you get to fully experience you know what you've been molding yourself for because you you know you just can't stay in the same group and, and continue to uh, try and think you're going to flourish at the same rate. You've got to mix it up. You got Yeah, mix. now I do. Um, most of the time I work with other producers because, like, I play guitar yeah. and bass and drums, and they send me tracks to, you know, do guitar overdubs or bass overdubs. But, yeah, and then it's just my story is so different because, like I said, I'm from, an, I'm from Arkansas. Like, oh. I'm from a town with only, like, 5,000 people. So... It took me 10 years just to scratch the surface. Like, I'm in Atlanta right now interning for, like I said, Ben Allen and DJ Burn One. And Ben but, Allen did, he yeah. did the uh, Lars Barkley album, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. just watching these people. But like I said, it took me 10 years just to scratch the surface because where I'm from, there's, like, no resources. Like, it took, like, just co different conversations to trigger different things to make me go do different things. Like... People were like, okay, you know all of this. You need to move. So right. I go to this place, and they, I go to this conference. They're like, you need to go to a beat battle. I'm like, what's a beat battle? Go to yeah. a beat battle. I lose, and they tell me, you need to work on your mixes. And I'm like, what's a mix? So now I'm, you know, it's triggering so much stuff to where I ended up going to school, and now I'm here. Yeah, but see, and, that's, and again, like Tremaine, that's a short 10 years. That's a very quick 10 years. Exactly. <laughs> okay. When I talk to you guys, I'm talking to you from somebody who's I'm edging up on 40 years. So Ooh. understand, when y'all say 10 years, it ain't shit. Nah. From what I've seen happen, I don't mean comparatively because I think what everybody's doing is great. I'm just saying, seeing the evolution of where I could count the people that look like me on one hand to where I can look all over the bottom of the screen and see people that look like everybody from every corner of the world. That is amazing to me. And then when you guys tell me the seriousness of what you're doing, and you've only been at it 10 years in this one, 10 years in this one, that's great, man. That's great. I mean, you guys, you guys are so far, so fast. I mean, and, and uh, uh, Jason's on the line here. Jason's an instructor. 
I'm Jason, if I, if I, you comment, please. If I'm lying, I'm I'm fine. I mean, let me know what you think as an instructor. Are, aren't they relatively what we call on the fast track? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I and and you know, I'm I I don't have too much experience to draw from myself because I'm still trying to scrape the surface of this music industry. But I, I, a lot of the kids that come in through school and uh, through my school, you know, day one. They have no idea what they're going to get through. You know, they they're going through the the beatville, and they they think that you know. And I and I kind of break it down to them like this. I say, look, you are one of forty thousand people in this Gwinnett County alone that's trying to make it in the hip hop business. Now you take the all five metro area counties of Atlanta and multiply that, and then start adding states and see what kind of you better be. You and you better have the talent. I'm not never just dis disputing that they have the talent or the drive, but to give them just a relative look, like look, this is what you're up against. You know what I mean? Can you can you can you do what? Um, uh, what's his name? Names are escaping me right now. But can you do what this producer is doing right now? Can you put out that kind of heat? You know, it, yeah. it's you know it's it's tough. Yeah, yeah. And especially just the one genre. Yeah. Because everybody's trying to get through that door. And that's why I always say, you know, some of these conversations, we, we got to look at some pie charts so you guys can understand on the economic scale of the music business. If we were to cut the music business up like a pizza, I want you to understand how small a slice that represents. That everybody's going for this one little window called eyes are gonna do a beat <laughs> right <laughs> and if we transferred and said well you know what I want to play I want to write with my friends over here who are doing heavy metal or rock and roll you would not believe the slight the size of the window and how much it increases when you look at the opportunities there because it's just it's just so small, but you have to back up and look at the whole of music, country western, techno, all these. Get a Billboard magazine, look at all the categories in there. You will see that it is such a small s slice, and so you have to look at what what finances are there to pay for everybody. Everybody can't be hitting big, right? Mm -hmm. And if everybody's going for for a little tiny window. There's got to be some place else to eat on this table called music, right? Yeah. But I leave it up to y'all to figure out where it is. I mean, I, I just think that um, you, you got to increase the conversation and you got to work on things that are other than the, the, the things that are comfortable. It's great to do beats. It's great to do hip-hop, rap, all the above. It, but it's also great to do something that's art music. It's great to do classical recording. It's great, great to do anything that tests the limits of what you know because it's going to make you stretch you know and if any of you guys are readers as engineers that's a that's a primary thing you need to be able to do is you need to be able to read so anything that's going to put some music in front of you a string date anything it's going to help you expand because you got to follow along with what's happening you know in in uh I don't don't get me wrong I think I think all of this good I I want everybody to work at the end of the day I want to see everybody working because that, that's what really makes it go. But I, I think the biggest thing that's going to keep you working is mixing it up, meeting people who you don't you haven't met yet, and then, and then looking at experiment with some other genres. You know, Absolutely. don't get stuck trying to resurrect, uh, you know, disco or, or any of these other things. Or, you know, I don't know. You know, there, there's a lot of things where, where we, we don't have to go for things that have already been done. You can look at all those things, learn from them, but create something new. Create something new with some new flavor and some new people who have a new uh, look about art. You know, the younger generation are called creatives for a reason. You know, it's because they're reaching everywhere and they're using everything. They're using mixed media. They're using a bunch of things that, that we didn't have access to. So even... Tremaine in his 10 years and where he's at, he's now old school in, in some circles because he's already had some experiences that outgrow his peer group, right? Right. 
right. So, so, so that's how fast it goes. That's how fast you have to kind of pay attention, you know. Dave, up here dropping that knowledge. I know, man. I didn't mean to drop no knowledge. Man, I, I thought love we, it. I thought we should have had an offering. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was going to be an A-B selection. I ain't know what was going on. <laughs> man, it's going to be a it. test. If you keep cracking jokes, I'm going to have a test. I'm going to get an invoice in about 10 minutes for $30. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'll shut up. I'll shut up. Yeah. But how do we combat that? I mean, you remember, well, I mean, when I was growing up in the 80s and the, the, the 70s and the 80s, um, and let's, I mean, let's talk about the inner city pe people, right? Yeah. Their get out of the, get out of the hood thing was the NBA or was the dreams of sports reality. Now yeah. it's becoming, well... I'm not that athletic, or I tore my ACL when I when I was in middle school. Well, this is my get rich quick out, right? The music business. Well, let me buy a computer. Let me do what I see somebody else doing in the thing. And this is this is my NBA dream now. You know what I mean? The music business right. and right. it overpopulating maybe. I don't know. I mean, it is. I think it is. It is a, a definitely a, some people's go-to market strategy for solving the problem of poverty. Okay, or the reality of poverty. Okay, it is definitely a, a, a mar you know something that people use. Myself, I was a, a nerdy kid, lived in South Central Los Angeles, and uh, you know. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't a desire to kind of do the music business it was just I didn't want to do the other things that were open to me I wanted to do this cuz it seemed interesting and and so I didn't really look at it as a way out of the hood I didn't see it I didn't know I was in the hood you know what I mean mm -hmm. I I kind of just but I did know I was in the hood as soon as I started working in in Beverly Hills as soon right. as I started working in private studios and going to Hollywood, then I knew I lived in the hood. So I guess you could say I did switch strategies, and I did. <laughs> I did want to get the fuck out. Yeah, it, it was. It, you know, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. It, it was definitely a motivator when I figured out that there was a greener grass, and it, it was a lot easier to 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 think freely and think creatively without the stigma of being in the inner city. That definitely was a uh, a motivator. I think nowadays people use it. Yeah, it is a get rich quick strategy. I think everybody wants to brand up and be like, "Look, man, if if you can have and and if anybody's a fan or works for him, I, I'm not. Uh, I think Ti is great. I but anytime you can you can have that much turmoil around your life, vis a vis guns and all the other accoutrement and drama, and then you can rap and save yourself from jail or whatever the chronology is, that's going to be something that little kids look at and go, I'm going to be just like T.I. Right. Right? Right. Man, look, that's, and, what, and, that's, and, that's where I live. And, and, and so I'm not trying to, you know, I don't want to get T.I. all mad and don't get his people all mad and, you know, just relax. But the reality is it sends imagery out there. It sends imagery out there that, that make people believe that if you do this and you do this, then you can have this aberrant behavior happen and you will no, there will be no consequences. Not the case. Not the case. And I think a lot of what happens in our business is set up like that. So you have to look at the messaging. This is the part of our business where, like I say, either we're part of the problem or we're part of the solution because we send messages every day. We send messages every day. I, I would love to see everybody working. If anybody here is going to work on Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj, I would love to see you get a check. Yep. Now, the, at the end of the day, the content that you get a check for, that's something that you're going to have to sleep on. When you start to have kids and you start to have grandkids, what you put out there in the world, you're going to have to start to figure out, is this? am I cool with this? Is this just a gig? Is it just a gig? Or, or am I just clocking my dollars and you know because there's a certain part about it where this mass messaging of this skewed concepts it, it comes home to roost 
it comes home to roost, and it comes home to roost in the inner city and in the downline of our families and in all the our community, whether we want to realize it or not, whether we want to say it or not. It it definitely is questionable. It definitely is questionable. So that I cannot really say that I'm fascinated when somebody says, "Yeah, I got a new tune. I want you to hear it," and all I hear is, "Whole bag, bitch." You know this, that. You know it. it right. It's. It, it, okay, now you've said it. You've used all these 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 uh, dramatic labels, and it's almost like a waste. It's almost like a waste. You know, th there's a there's a way you can save cussing so that it has drama when you need it. Right. But if you use it every day, <laughs> it it has no meaning. It has no 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 drama. And and those words are saved and used for effect. I don't know how y'all use them, but I use it for effect. Right. So so if you if your dialogue is filled with that all the time, now that, now there's a whole genre of music though that. Everybody's okay with that, man. You know, we 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 just trying to bring back. You know, we want to bring back the filth, just like NWA and everybody who was. And that's cool. Maybe there's a there's a small sect of people all over who just wants to hear that. But again, there is a whip effect from putting out that kind of material because you have all this other stuff that comes along with it. The 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 uh, you know, and we're in a we're in a culture where everything is is protestable and debatable now. So you can't have all these misogynistic images images and misogynistic phrases in your music because you have a lot of women who will come down on you, a lot of women's groups and all these other things. You have all these things. When you want to be marketable and you want to make money, you cannot freely offend. Hmm. You understand right. that? You want to make money, you want to cash a check, you cannot freely offend. You we're in America, the land of the free, but you you try and say anything you want and see if you're going to be able to make money off of everything. It ain't going to work like that. It ain't going to work like that. If you do, you're going to have to check out what you sell and how you sell it, and you got to sign up from it from the beginning. Hence Lil Wayne, hence all these animated characters that you see paraded in front of you that do the music that they do. And then it's the messaging that's there, and and it's fully financed, and it's okay. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't have merit, because there's people out there. Man, I love Lil Wayne. Screw him, right? Okay, <laughs> and you can think that, but but at the end of the day, I want you just to cut the music off and say the lyrics to yourself and tell me what it's saying. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and I I hate that because, like I said, y'all y'all talking about the inner city, and like I said, I'm from a small town, uh -huh. and, and basically where I'm from, like. I was raised by my grandparents, so all I listen to is like Johnny Taylor, Al Green, and because Al Green is from where I'm from. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, but well, I say all that to say like small towns are very impressionable. So when they see a a Ti or a Wayne, these are right. things that they are actually doing. Like there is no job opportunity. There is no. And they believe it, right? Yeah, because right. I'm I, I'm a preacher's kid. You get what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I grew up around like family that lived in Memphis that took me to different things to expose me to different things but when I see my friends rap back home like everybody in the video literally has either murdered somebody or mm -hmm. robbed somebody or you know they got some type of charge and I hate seeing major rappers get on like conferences talking about where we don't raise your kids yes you do because not too many people everybody nowadays single parent homes is the norm, norm. So TV right. is raising people, and people right. don't, people on the TV don't take as much responsibility for what they say and do as they should, and I feel like that's that's really messed up. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and uh, we'll probably get a bunch of people who will chime in and say, oh, they're gonna get get on their moral high ground. This is something that is is an issue, and will be an issue with everybody on here who's gonna work, because we, I, I had to cross this. Tremaine has had, everybody has had to cross the bridge. Where you get a call to work on something and you're going like, I'm not really in line with that, but I'm in line with making this money because this is what I do for a living. And you ha you're going to have to cross that bridge. You're going to have to cross that bridge. I I've worked for some people that I will not say. I won't say because because it was it was at a time where I was doing my thing and the phone rang and they had my rate. Right. Know? 
And they it, always have the money. They always have the money, right. Yeah. And so did I question it? No, I didn't question it. I just backed off and I thought about it afterwards and said, wow, well, should I really have done that? And I, you know, and I don't know, you know what, let me just keep on going. Lesson, you know. But it, again, these are all things that everybody will cross. So there's a point at which, you know, we're creating art. We're creating art for consumption. When the mass consumption happens and popularity happens, we have to look at the art we created and make sure, was there anything else that went along with this? Or, you know, was this pure art? Or was this some of my bullshit mixed in? Or, you know, you're going to have to really check yourself when you go to do these things because there's so many puddles you can step in, you know, and, and again, artistry on the other side, fully financed, looks like Jay-Z, right? Fully financed artistry looks like Jay-Z, so you do anything you want. Looks like Kanye. I do anything I want. I'm Kanye, right? So, so if that's representative to everybody who wants to, you know, uh, uh, emulate it, there's there, the reality is there's a there's an in between area before you get to be those guys, okay? There's there's all the other stages of of I might be able to sell some things I might be able to do this I'm I'm getting consistent at this and this you know there's 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 small steps before you get to where those guys are but the fact is take away the financing take away the messaging they'd be like everybody else. Be like everybody else. If you just listen to the words they're saying, take away the finances, take away the messaging, take away the branded experience, the headphones, the tennis shoes, it's the same message everybody else has, isn't it? Yeah. There's just a little bit louder and a little bit better color. Yeah, it's polished. <laughs> it's polished. It's polished. And there, hence where we are professionals. We're professional turd polishers in some yes, cases. Sir. So... <laughs> So, you know, understand that at every level of the game, there's, there's participation. So, because if Jay-Z called tomorrow, I'd take the call. Tremaine would take the call. Jason would. would take the call. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> we, we, we've crossed that bridge, and we understand where we're at, but we would take the call, okay? Absolutely. You know, but, but the reality is that you really have to think about it, and, and you know, we do... You know, look, man, as an engineer, every everything that we work on is a document that proves that we were here doing something. So you got to be real careful about the things that you press forward on. Right. Hey, guys, uh, I don't mean to interrupt. I am just making a making a move. It's been a fantastic hangout. I'll, I'll catch up with you guys uh, on, a little later. Thanks All for right, your time, man, and Dave. Thanks All for right, man, be cool, man. Take it easy. All right, guys. You're not, you're not you're not going to give us a scoop on what happened with Mr. Six Foot Seven while you were there? The stuff he don't want to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> Tremaine is the best, man. Uh, <laughs> he's the future, man. I'm telling you. Yeah, yes, kill it. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right, All right Eli. Peace out, bro. Yeah, Tremaine, you see I posted that picture of you in that car. Hey, man. It's a struggle for tall people. <laughs> I can't fit under desk either. Like, if I'm at a console... Nah, I'm usually knee level with the console, which kind of sucks. What he's not telling you is he has a driver. <laughs> he has a driver, and he has he has a fleet of of uh, girls that are his drivers. They, they they're female chauffeurs, and they take him everywhere. He's got a car that says six seven. That's what you need, and it rolls up. See, he didn't tell you he, didn't tell you he rolls like that. <laughs> Who paying for them? That's that Minneapolis <laughs> gangster stuff that you got from Jimmy and Terry. Right. <laughs> Mor Morris taught me that. Morris taught me that. Uh. <laughs> yeah. When's your When's your seminar, Jermaine? Seminar. I don't know what you call it. Conference. Um. What? The mix with the Masters conference. Mott's Ma no. Mott's doing another show. He's doing a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> he got all um, the wrong information. It's up in the conference. Who you work with? Oh, man. I know what he's talking about. I know what he's talking about. The, he don't the take one in no. Oakland? He, don't, he don't have no pencil and pad. <laughs> you talking about the joint in Oakland? <laughs> yeah, up in the Bay Area. Um, that's uh, the I'm second week this. of June, I think. Um, and it's just a. Uh, it's called the California Music Industry Summit, and uh, yeah. 
That's I believe that's June thirteenth and fourteenth, and they're gonna um, they have everybody up there. I think this year they're having uh, Ivan, who did uh, his, him and his partner Carvin and Ivan. They did all the music soul child stuff for like the first three albums or so. Uh, so he'll be up there. I think we had uh, Bill Tan up there one year. Um, I think the head of Pandora came and was the keynote one year. So it's a lot of dope people to come through, but it's in Oakland uh, the 13th and the 14th of uh, this year. Ooh. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Y'all are out of questions. Okay. Is there any, uh, any other conferences or anything coming up that I should be knowing about? Um... No, I, no conferences that I know of. Dave might know more than me for that, but I know as far as uh, I'm on the P and E committee for the LA chapter of things for the Grammys, and so we have a bunch of producer and engineer events uh, that we're planning for this year out here, and we're just basically trying to bring the producer and engineer community together because this is stuff like this is really the only time we're all and it's just us and not managers and artists and everything else like it's just producers and engineers so we're really focusing on that right now uh, out here for the LA chapter so we have an event tomorrow it's going to be our first one and it's going to be hosted by uh, Brian Maloof and Mike Klink then the next one I think is going to be uh, Manny Markowin and Alex the Kid maybe and then so we're just going to have different people I think Sheps is going to do one and just have different people uh, be the host for the night and get just a, a community out and I'm sure in whatever city you're in, if you're in the U.S., um, check with your your chapter, uh, your the closest chapter to you as far as the Grammys, because we're really trying to put on more events for the members um, and trying to get everybody, you know, just get the music community together, because uh, there's it's not a lot of stuff for music professionals that are vetted music professionals, not just a bunch of folks in a room. So uh, go to Grammy.com doing my plug and uh, go see where the chapter is try to join if you have enough credits uh, you can join as a voting member if you don't have enough credits you can join as an associate hundred bucks a year either way and uh, Maad will tell you he was just here uh, for our event we had a town hall thing um, the events and the networking that goes down man it's it's great you'll meet so many people uh, and I've met so many clients via these events um, so, uh, yeah, definitely check that out when you can on Grammy.com. You just snitched on me, man. I said that I was working. Yeah, that was. <laughs> hey, look, that is work, though. <laughs> that is work. <laughs> the, um, no, the, the, the stuff like you're talking about happening tonight, um, explain that again. What, what's, what will be going on with Manny Marroquin when he comes in and does it or whatever? Um, so it's uh, the one tomorrow night. It's gonna be. It's just a mixer. So we're meeting up at this restaurant. And it's gonna be about 75 to 100 people, and it's only producers and engineers. Um, and so it's the LA community of producers and engineers, and just trying to get everybody to meet each other. Because when do we ever see each other outside of the studio? Like when are you gonna meet another engineer in the city? Like unless you just randomly run into them, or y'all just happen to have mutual friends. So. This will put everybody together. You might, as an engineer, you might need a producer that needs an engineer. As a producer, you might need an engineer that's looking for work. Gotcha. So, you know what I'm saying? It's a great networking event, and it's free. Once you join the Grammys, like, all our events are free for members. So you just sign up at Grammy.com, or is there something particular I need to... Uh... Uh, you go to Grammy.com, and uh, you uh, sign up for membership. Uh, if you, Like I said, if you have enough credits... Uh, it's like I think it's the number might have changed, but I thought it was six physical, like store credits, and then like twelve digital. Uh, it's either one or the other. So uh, twelve digital credits or six physical credits, and um, you can join hundred bucks a year as an associate or a um, or a voting member. And um, Say you join as an associate, you still get to go to all the events. The only difference between you and the voting member is the voting member votes for the actual Grammys. And within that, if you worked on a project, you can vote for yourself. <laughs> so you, know so you, you was part of the voting committee, right? Yeah. So how did it, I know you get that question a lot about the whole Kendrick Lamar, Max Lamar thing. Like, how was that 
Like, how did the voting come about? Well, um, I mean, at the end of the day, man, you got to see who has a bigger uh, reach. Like, as dope as Kendrick is, dope Kendrick is dope in the hip hop community. Macklemore is dope worldwide. Everywhere. Yeah, Macklemore is on every commercial, every movie trailer, every everything, TV show. So just the span of the voters, if they see Macklemore's name. They don't know. They didn't listen to. They might not have heard Jay Z, uh, Kendrick, Kanye, or Drake's album. They know they heard that Macklemore record and they loved it. So that's what got the vote. And so it's just not so here, enough awareness for Kendrick. So here's what you're saying to us, bro. The hip hop community is being decided by that crap. Non hip hop people. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's the thing. Heard. We don't. We don't have enough people in the organization to represent hip hop. Oh, like look, if I'm we sorry, had more mind. people but that's what I'm saying. Like if we had more people that were hip hop based, then that wouldn't be the case. But it's it's yeah. I, if you got every person, every person that listened to that Kendrick album that's a member of the Grammys that voted for Kendrick album, he still probably wouldn't have won just because the numbers that Macklemore reached like his awareness is there compared to Kendrick, and I, I personally, I voted for Kendrick for every, everything that he possibly could have won. He got my vote, but it's just the numbers, man. That's the way it is. See, that reduces the validity of the Grammys to some of us. That very thing, no matter what the number reality is, right? Like KRS One, who's dope, and some Jive Turkey wins. Not that Macklemore's Jive Turkey at all, but if. Right. if some jive turkey wins, and then we're told this is the great man. Get out of here! It's like, come on, it, it's there's no right. legitimacy to us, and so well, like, like on Macklemore, but we're real quick on Macklemore. If that had been that thrift shop store, the thrift shop song, I wouldn't say a word because thrift shop <laughs> that was a jam. <laughs> but the song that won, it's like, come on, man, for real, that's the one. Yeah. That won. So to me, I was I was at the Grammys like this, really. Yeah, I mean, and and that's the. But here's the thing, though. Like when those situations happen, it's either you get mad and you're like, "F the Grammys," or you're like, "What do we gotta do to change this?" And so my thing is, I'm in here. I see how this works. What do I need to do so this won't happen again? So I've been out here trying to get people that are eligible to join. I'm like, "Yo, you gotta join, or this will continue to happen. It might be worse next time. I don't know how it could get worse, but." Uh, it might be worse next time. Like you gotta, you gotta join. You gotta, you know, let your voice be heard. It's like if Obama would have lost, you couldn't be mad because you didn't vote. You know what I'm saying? You, on, you honestly yeah. believe that we we're gonna fill the the Grammys up with some hip hop type, rap type folks to get it's that. Not, it's not filling it up. It's just having enough voices there. So when About there is an that. issue, they will listen. Because right now the voice is here. Like we need. A bigger like when they took out those categories, you had the Latin community standing outside of the Grammy office, like with picket signs going crazy, and you had like in the urban community actually got mad and so they brought back some of those categories. They silently did it, but some of those categories did come back. So it's just you just need to gather together enough people so your voice is heard, and we can't do that if everybody's mad. And I understand that. Like believe me, I was hot. I'm still hot, like, cause I'm such a huge Kendrick fan. I was, I was really pissed, but it's like, okay, what am I gonna do so this won't ever happen again? What so now? Did, what? Oh yeah, so now I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, get people involved. Things like that. If I gotta come into your house and try to do some trickery and get some numbers and work, man, I'd rather build my own house. That was why I liked B. That, that was why I liked BET. Um, before dude sold BET off, which which killed me. But oh my gosh, um, that, that was why I liked BET was because okay, I'll I put it this way: a black dude got hung in 1993, I think it was, and the only station that I and drug through the streets, and the only station that I saw it on was BET and NBC. None of them, none of them covered it, and we would then end up in an argument. Well, it's not big enough news. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, but that's why we get our own table and create our own thing. Now, I'm, I'm you know, I'm part of the Grammys. I, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. But um, 
me personally, like I said, I would rather us start up our own thing and we bust our butts and and you know create something. Now, I will get in there and fight with you in the Grammys. I'm you know I'm a fighter, man. I go to war. Right. But seriously, at the but, end of the day, this, me sitting as I'm feel like I'm sitting at somebody else's table as a, a room full of whoever. And I'm sitting at their table telling them, nah, Macklemore is not. And if you tell me that Macklemore is reaching all these people, yeah, who's putting him in front of all them people? Put Kendrick right. in front of all them people, you know? Well, I mean, and that's that's the thing, though. It's it's we need we need you. We need a whole bunch of people. And the Grammy, like, we're just now. That I'm on the board. Like, is I think I might have been one of the youngest and the youngest black people ever on that LA chapter board. Like, we're trying to diversify. Right now, and so this is like the beginning stages. So it was like, yeah, you really are coming in somebody else's house trying to redecorate. And I mean, and but the thing is, right now they're actually open to it, and that's the dope thing. It's like they are down to listen to what we have to say, but we just need to have enough voices. Because if I'm just in there by myself saying it, it is going to fall on deaf ears, unfortunately. Because it's just how do I get in person. there? Uh, you just need to be a member. You need to like you're doing the right thing. You come to I'm events. I'm a voting member. How do I get in there? So you come to events. You get to know the people. Like after you come to a couple of events, you'll start to see the same people. You develop these relationships. And mind you, I've been a member for nine you're years. Old. Yep, you're old. I know. <laughs> no. Nah. So I, I've been a I've been a voting member for nine years. So I've been going to their events for nine years. So most of the LA chapter membership at this point, like if I don't know them by name, I know them by face. And so getting around these people, being around these people, and as they get to know you and they see you and they're like, Oh, what you working on? And, you know, you kind of develop this rapport with them and it leads into they come to ask me if I wanted to run to be on the board because you have to be elected but you have to get to that point where they feel that comfortable with you where they're like yo you can really contribute something um, to what we're doing and the change we're trying to make so they're definitely trying to change things and they're open to hearing things we just gotta get the membership up man in so this I side of things. Spend five years of my life in somebody else's house trying to fix something that's in my house. Hey, take Next time man. Civil rights yeah. movement didn't happen overnight <laughs> the civil rights movement. Okay, I got you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Again, um, I'm actually bred for this, uh, for the fight. But um, I was, yeah, I was disappointed in that. I, I really wish, like, for Macklemore, that thrift shop st song. I'm sorry, bro. That, that's my song. If, if that would have won, I'd have been up there. Every black person or hip hop person or whoever would have stood up and said something. I'd been like, hey man, he was in his, he was in a onesie. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but, but my my <laughs> argument is it's just if you listen to the projects. I mean, I'm not I'm not biased by no means. I mean, if he deserved it, he deserved it. But it was a better body of work, though. Uh, for Kendrick. Yeah, like oh, Kendrick by far had the best. I'd say, in now, my opinion, the best album of the year. That's what like, I'm saying. Like period. it was, it was track for right. track, structured, sequenced. Everything was just. Now, if it was Section 80, man, I probably would have went to jail. I probably would have blew up the Grammys. I ain't going to lie to you. <laughs> like, Have any of y'all heard Tech Nine's work last year? I didn't see any tech stuff last year. No. I ain't going to lie. I didn't, I didn't slept on Tech Nine this whole time. I, 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 I respect his business side. I respect him business-wise, but musically, I, it just it don't sit well with me. See, that's, that's part of the problem is, is Dr. Dre grabs Kendrick Lamar, and now he's in the scene. Somebody else grabs Katy Perry, you know, and these specific people are, are brought in like nepotism type of thing. Whoever, like once Tremaine is in, Tremaine decides I'm going to bring Vladdy in, so everybody's looking at Vladdy. You got Tech 9 out there. You got all these other people. One person came in as an independent and then got snatched up and that was Macklemore and he did his, you know, he did his thing, but you've got all of these artists that will never ever have a chance and they're dope. And yet, like, I, somebody was telling me there's no dope females, and then I go grab videos and show some dope females. They're like, wow, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, just like you thought Eminem was the only dope rapper. I, you, know, you know, I know. You know. <laughs> well, well, I, don't think Nine, I don't think Tech Nine even cares about any accolades or nothing like that. Why should he? He's very successful, though. Tech getting that money. Yeah, yeah I'm saying, stupid he's, money. he's so successful, so he shouldn't even. T I mean, if you think about it in history, half the 
the dopest MCs that ever came through, none of them have a Grammy. Tupac don't have no Grammy. And what did the guys like Public Enemy? They said, "Who gives a fuck? A, who gives a damn about a goddamn Grammy? Who gives a, a, you know it, it? That's you know, but that the whole the idea, like what Tremaine is saying, is they're, they're trying to change that. But you're gonna have to get some people in there who are actually in the hip hop community. And and that's the thing, man. We do like the staff is changing. Everything is like behind the scenes that you can't see. Things are changing behind the scenes. It just takes time for it to present itself. Uh, and so, like, things are changing. Like, just don't think, like, I'm just saying that. But, like, I'm watching things take place. And I'm You got to come back home to the hood. I know you ain't just saying stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm not. And then as, as well as Dave. Dave is up in there, too. And, uh, like, you know, we're, we're, we're up there. And we're not the ones to sit there and let stuff happen. Like, we will talk. You will know how we feel about things. And uh, hopefully you have listen. no power, do you? Uh, not yet. I'm still a baby in this. Like, you know, this thing takes time, man. It's just the nature of the beast. It takes time. That's the way it is. Very, that's, but a you, very, that's a very familiar thing to be told. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> and that's what it is. Like, you and know. Again, that's why we make our own table. <laughs> that's why BET was created. True. Hey guys, speaking, of, speaking about time, um, how do you, what do you think about, um, do you know when someone starts out, uh, the songs that are actually produced are not that of, a, of, that, a, of that great quality. So, um, if they're good songs, but not perfectly uh, sounding, but if you have the music, what do you think, is it worth it uh, just going for it, just going for a release that's not, not that, I mean, it, it's, it sounds decent, but it, it, it sounds like it's, it's, it's from a home, you know, bedroom right. and set up. So well, what do you think about stuff like that? Um, yeah, man, I mean, especially as engineers, like, we all know, for the most part, uh, what it should sound like. Even if we can't exactly achieve that sound just yet, we know what it should sound like. And so, personally, I wouldn't, and it's just me, I wouldn't release it if I don't feel like it's, you know, quality-wise, sonically. Like, if I don't feel like it's it's there, then I'm not going to release it. Because then it's like, okay, I release it, a couple of my friends buy it, but then outside of that, what happens? Like nothing happens because you can't go necessarily shop it to a network and try to get a sync placement because the quality isn't that great. Because if you take it to TV or film, the quality needs to be commercially polished. And so uh, that's the that's the thing. It's like yeah, you might sell a couple records, release it, and then you know, long term, what was the point? I mean, you could have just held onto it, worked it a little more, cleaned it up until you figured out how to get that right sound, then put it out, and then you have more options when it's actually out. My my take on, I, I agree with all that. Um, the other side, part of the other side to that for me is timeliness. Um, something might not be perfect sonically, but um, if you let that time pass, like if Obama's in an election and this song is for that time, you let that time pass because the sound quality wasn't there. You screwed up. Some things are, are based on the moment um, and the situation. Um, the way I explain it, well, the way I've been explaining it lately to people in, in here is if I have a match right now and I light it, so what? But since Tremaine is from the Grammys and he's a traitor, and if I sat him next to me and poured gasoline on him, then I light a match. The whole situation has changed. So everything's based on situation or things there's there's a situation in time. And so you go ahead and hold on to some of these songs that actually need to be put out at that moment that would actually take over people like Bob Dylan or something. You go ahead and let that moment pass when it's that type of thing and you've made a mistake. You can always that song if it's really that powerful can actually be remade because it'll, you know, do its thing. We had a song out here like that. Um with, with this iMac crew. They, they released the song, did a whole video, 
it took off, then they asked me to mix it. I came in and gave them a mix mix. Um, so that that's the only thing I'd add to that. Yeah, you know, because it's the indie, the indie stuff is a bit when you have no budget. Sometimes I remember Dave Hampton saying, uh, you know, just make the songs. Don't constant. Don't don't spend a, a year on just one song. Just make make the songs. I mean, after for instance, if after this EP there there'll be another EP which will be of better quality. Uh, no. Don't, and, and you realize that, Tremaine, who, who, who do you know has spent a year, two years, three years on a song um, that actually took that amount of time on a song and did good? Um, that actually happens quite often. <laughs> like, it's just you don't know that it took that long for that song to happen. But uh, even with, like, Jimmy and Terry, like, his songs, we started when I first got there. And three years later, we put the record out. Uh, you just let it. I don't know. I don't know. I look at it as letting it marinate. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but and then it also depends on the type of music you're doing. Don't get me wrong. Because some stuff, like if you're doing like pop music, the sound at that moment, like you might just have to release it at that moment. Because if you wait a year, that sound will be. It would have expired. You know what I'm saying? So it, it kind of depends on every situation, but like some stuff, like if you're not necessarily doing something that sounds like right now, and it's just like some timeless stuff, it, you know, I I let it marinate. I got some stuff that's been sitting on my drive for a while, and I could put it out tomorrow, and it's six years old. You have no idea. But it's just I don't know. Timing is everything, uh, and like you said, like it, you know, stuff can get remixed or you know. It just depends. It depends on the genre. It depends on the song. Everything. It's a lot of variables in there. And uh, Alex the Kid, a couple records he did for Dr. Dre, he made like three or four years before you know he sent it to before he even met Dr. Dre. He did a few revisions because I think that I need a doctor. I think it had um, Alicia Keys on it at first, but he right. felt like it didn't fit, so he found somebody else. And a few years later, that's when he got it played. Right. Yeah, that's the that's the other trick of the game I learned early on is records get passed around behind the scenes so much. It's more visible now via YouTube because people were posting, you know, the demos and whatever. Uh, but yeah, like a lot of records get passed around to different artists before they come out on the actual artist that you hear on the radio, it probably is in two or three other hands and that other person sang it and it just didn't come off right. So you just got to pass it off to the next until the record is right. You can't just put it out. And this goes back to you can't just put it out because Britney Spears is on it. It might not feel right. You might need to take this over. I think Pharrell did this. He had Britney on a record and he was like, eh, and took it over to Janet. And Janet smashed it ten times better than Britney. It's like just I'm gonna like, roll with that instead. Just like uh, watch the th not watch the yeah, doing watch the throne. What's that song? Holy Grail. It had Dream on it at first, and they took right. Dream off and put Justin Timberlake. Right. And that song, they they I think Jay Z and Kanye got into it because that song Kanye wanted that song to be on Watch the Throne, and Watch the Throne came out what like two three years ago. Yeah. And uh, Holy Grail came out last year. Right. So basically, they've been sitting on that song for a nice little minute. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to it, you could have put it out two or three years ago, and you could have put it out today. Like it doesn't. I mean, the only thing that was kind of about it is kind of had the the trap hi hats and whatnot. But man, let's not go there. <laughs> Them flying right. hi hats, and all that. right? Sixty fourth hi hats and whatnot. But it's. I mean, outside of that, like that song didn't necessarily have a sound where. Like, it had to be out. Yeah, like, it had to be out that time. So. Yeah, you know, go on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. All right, all right. So, I, you, you got it talking about major, major artists, major labels. But uh, when you're, uh, so the thing is, me and, uh, and, uh, and this really talented guy have been, Producing an EP for over a year and a half now, and we've been holding back. But um, 
you know, we've got to move on eventually. So that's why I was asking. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, the wisdom, guys. I uh, really put it to good use. <laughs> tell, man, tell, us, tell us some business stuff that'll help us. You were saying earlier that there's business stuff that we don't necessarily get taught. People don't want to open up and say nothing. You know, just whatever business stuff. Um. No, I mean for the for the most part, man. I have uh, I have a manager, and she is epic. Uh, she actually used to be my boss when I was interning. She was an intern coordinator. And uh, the relationship kind of developed from there where she ended up quitting the label that we were at. And, um, and like, I would keep calling her when I got in production situations and didn't know how to read a production contract at the time or producer agreement. And so I would keep calling her, and the relationship kind of just developed into now she's my manager. And she holds me down like no other. Like, she is the greatest. I call her, like, my West Coast mom. But, um, you know, having her on my side, like, she, she's taught me how to read the contracts um, as well as uh, Dave. Like, Dave has been, like, the ultimate mentor as far as uh, when I get in any situation that technically, like, that I don't know what to do, I hit Dave on a text or a phone call, and he, you know, he comes through every time, but uh, my manager, like, she handles everything. She taught me how to read these contracts. Uh, she taught me everything I need to know about publishing, um, which is so important for producers and writers. And I've seen so many people lose so much money uh, with publishing issues. And that's CSAC, ASCAP, BMI, and uh, needing to register and knowing which one to go with, which best fits your situation. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff, like, people don't really talk about. I know y'all talk about a lot of technical stuff, but the, the other side, the money side, we do all this to get paid because we love it and we want to get paid. And so you got to make sure the money is right and starting your uh, LLC and all that kind of stuff. Um, you got to, you know, handle your business taxes. Uh, and Dave walked me through the tax stuff as well as my manager. But um, it's a lot of different sides to this thing other than the music. And do you think well, I'm eating right now, but um to me my partner, he's a songwriter, I was thinking about hey man, chill out. I was thinking about um going to Nashville. Cause like where I went to school at, it was on Music Row and like BMI was like right across the street. ASCAP was right over here and CSAC like do you think it's better to actually set up meetings and talk to these people to see which one of them actually picked your situation or just you can basically, you know, pinpoint and just go into the website and read the information? Um, the website will help. And then talking to writers, man, like talking to other writers, that's really going to – because the company is going to give you the company spiel. Like they're going to give you the corporate yeah. spiel like they got to give you. You're not going to get the real answer until you talk to these artists that are signed with ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, and you talk to the three, and you they tell you about different situations, and it really helps when, uh, like, some of the, most of the stuff I've worked on, I've been the only CSAC writer. So mm -hmm. I have a CSAC writer, a BMI writer, and an ASCAP writer, and when it comes time to get paid, a lot of the times I get mine first. I get paid more if our percentages are the same. I end up getting more money, and... Um, a lot of times their stuff doesn't track, like a lot of the overseas stuff and random stuff here and there. Um, it'll it'll show up on my statement, and we all like registered the song. Like I'll sit down with everybody, and we'll all register it on the computer together and make sure everybody's splits are right. And um, like I'll end up, it'll show up on my statement, and it never shows up on the ASCAP people statement. And that's just me as a CSAC writer. That best fit me and my manager put me in that in that world. And CSAC is invitation only, right? Like you just right. you, you just can't sign up for CSAC. They gotta accept you. Right. Yeah, you oh. gotta go like, you know, I went up there and played them some records and um it was like cool. And they let me in, but that was that was the move right there because my dude was with ASCAP and I was getting paid for stuff that that's still to this day, like two, three years ago. 
to to this day it's not showed up on his statement. Like ASCAP just completely missed it. All right, ASCAP really don't fool with you unless you just you know making some type of hit hits. Like they really right. just don't. Right, but well, that's the thing because it's so easy to sign up for ASCAP and BMI. I think it actually costs to sign up, but uh, with those, it's so it's so much. The quantity is so many writers that they can't go through and check on you because they got Quincy Jones stuff they're trying to track. They got Jimmy and Terry stuff they're trying to track. So your stuff kind of falls to the bottom of the list. CSAC is smaller, more of a boutique type situation. So. Uh, even like I had a situation where uh, something was missing off my statement that should have been there, and so I called my CSAC rep. Uh, he answers the phone, which good luck getting a phone call at ASCAP or BMI. And um, I call him, and then a week later, the money is deposited into my account, and it was fixed like that quick. Like I just can't say. I've been there with my friends when they're trying to get somebody on the phone at ASCAP or BMI, and I've seen them sit on hold forever. I got my CSAC dude's cell phone number. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it, it, it can happen like that. So that's that's why I'm with them. It's a smaller situation. And I don't know. It feels more like a family than the machine of ASCAP and BMI. Do you um Are you registered with, like, Sound Exchange or anything like that, too? Yeah, I'm with Sound Exchange, too. Yeah, my manager, once again, she's the one that pushed, like, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. she, she stays on me about it and kind of put me up on game, so now I understand it a lot more. Yeah, like, I heard you mention the uh, All You Need to Know About the Music Industry book, like, I mean, music business. We yeah. got that in school, and it's, like, lately, these past couple months, like, I haven't been working on music. All I've been doing is interning and just, I sit and just study music business because, like you said, it's, like, like the, the, the black area of what we doing and people just don't talk about. So, but yeah, right. I'm glad you dropping the info though. No problem, man. I, I just, uh, you know, and I, and I told him that, that I like if y'all needed to know business stuff, I know it's kind of like the taboo thing and nobody really wants to ask those kind of questions because they feel like they're getting kind of personal. But like, I mean, y'all need to know it. And if I know it, I'll gladly share it because I want everybody to win get this money, man, because so many sources of income that we need to be capitalizing on. I just want to thank everybody in this uh, Google Hangout because, like, I didn't know people were out here just really just giving out info like that because, like I said, where I'm, I keep going back to where I'm from because it's just, it's so messed up. Like, I keep running, I kept running into people that I'll ask them a question like, what is publishing? What is this? And they'd be like, well, maybe if you sign to my label, I'll tell you. And I'm looking like, really? Really, no, dude? No. Like, one dude, he was. I was in a session with somebody, and dude was on Pro Tools, and I'm sitting there trying to, you know, watch and see because I've never seen Pro Tools before. He literally was turning his back like this and typing real fast because he didn't want me to, you know, he didn't want me to learn. But like I said, I appreciate y'all, man, because, like I said, I didn't know – that it was just out here like that, like a community of people that actually just give advice and, you know, from personal experiences and things like that. So, yeah, this is definitely pretty cool. Absolutely, man. No problem. Once we're signed on to, um, say, BMI, are we able to switch to CSAC? Yeah, um, you can switch over. It's a process. Uh, it's actually my friend just did it. My artist is going to do it, I think. But they, when you sign up, they basically sign you to, I think it's like every two years, it automatically renews like that you're with that company. So you have to send a letter uh, saying that you need to know when your uh, expiration date is. And in that expiration date, say it's like June 2015, I think you have like six weeks or something like that. Uh, to let them know that you want to leave, and then from there you can you're free to go wherever. But any music that you did at that time is still going to be processed through them until you sign with this uh, whatever new situation. I think Morris Mingos want to join us. You want to join us, Morris? Yeah, Tremaine, I'm sitting there looking at him. He's waiting on you. What's wrong with you? Hey, man, I'm just getting 
Jermaine said, hurry before he pimp slap you. <laughs> All right, bro. All right. I want to say I'm, I've been learning a lot of new um, uh, language from you guys since I joined the Hangout. <laughs> I'm sure. I've been knowing um, Morris for a long time, for like, well, a long time, three years, a long time on the internet. Um, and just this year at NAMM, he, he's like, yeah, I've been doing music with Bootsy Collins, blah, 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 all them years, those three years. He was uh, doing work with Bootsy Collins and, and some other people, and I had no clue. Oh, wow. Here, here he is right now. There you go. You, you yeah, understand? Man, I'm, huh? I'm just getting out this rehearsal, and um, hopefully at last, you know, driving in the car, you know, cell phone signal. How long is it going to take you to get to your house so you can get on the computer? Uh, Man, I'd say about an hour, man. You man ain't got no time to be waiting on you for an hour, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, hey, so let's just maximize what we had now, man. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm at the notebook already in. You got any questions for Tremaine? Uh, yeah. Let me ask you this. What's your number one way of resolving issues um, with like bass, okay? Wait, with bass? Is that what you said? Yeah, he said with bass, but I think he was going to have another right, question. Different part to it. Yeah, it looked like he's about to say probably bass and kick relationship or something like that. Oh, well, that's what it was? I mean, I don't know. I'm assuming because, you know, it just... Yeah, let's assume. <laughs> it just, all right, it just we, can, we can assume that. Uh, all right, bass and kick relationship. Uh, I don't know. It's... Do you do the scoop? Do you do the scoop and bump uh, EQ trick? Um, yeah, it's more... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that wasn't him. Okay. Uh, no, I... I'm trying to think how I handle that. Cause it's more, the the most of the time when I come across that issue, it's with my own stuff, and I just make the decision to pull one down. I don't even really have an EQ thing. It's like, who do I want to win? What's more important to this situation? Uh, so I, I actually, actually in my mixes, a lot of stuff I've done, I, I honestly haven't had to deal with that. You've um the, like getting screwed over credit, especially when a person is new. Um, how have you resolved that, or what have you been through with you know as far as credit issues? <laughs> that is the never-ending saga right there. Um, it's uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, you're gonna get burned. Like that's just part of the game. Uh, it's just you gotta learn when you're getting burned and when it's best to just leave it alone and walk away. Uh, but I mean, for the most part, you're going to get screwed. Um, just all you can really do is is uh, when you get done with a record, you kind of try to stay in touch, whether it's the artist or artist management, and kind of try to just follow up or even just follow them on Twitter to see when they're going to say the album's releasing. So then you can kind of slide in and be like, hey, uh, saw the album's about to drop. Uh, just wanted to make sure, our, our, is the song that we worked on going to be on it, one, and then two, once they, if they say yes, you're like, okay, uh, if you have like some nickname or something, you got to let them know, you know, the spelling for it or whatever. And, you know, kind of just try to slide your way in it, but, you know, just don't come at people like, hey, I want my credits on this record because that never works having that attitude that'll get you nowhere so you kind of just got to be be the nice guy slide in and uh, and do it but I mean you will get screwed out of a couple records I don't know any dope engineer uh, that has major credits now that didn't work on like a big album when they were coming up and just didn't get credits or got stuck with some uh, stupid credit that they really didn't do like it just that just happens you got to deal with it. You'll be mad. You have the right to be mad, but <laughs> there's nothing really you gonna uh, you can do about it because the record will be out 
most of the time that's when you find out that you weren't in the credits is when you buy the album and you're like, my name is nowhere in here. Uh, or you just gave me an assistant credit and I did not assist. I was the only engineer there. So you, you learn to deal with it and you learn sly little ways to make sure that you're in there without just being straight up and blunt. Um, sometimes you have to do that for the most part. Just just take the nice approach because people will uh, respond better with that. All right, guys, it's been a blast. I wanted to thank you all for uh, for for all the knowledge, all, all the great, uh, the fun time, you know. And uh, wish you uh, have a great day, and uh, or whatever is it night with you. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, it was great. Yeah. Uh, see you guys. All right, man. Good all night. Night. Hey, Morris. Issue between bass and what? Morris, the issue between bass and what? Okay, you're muted. You're muted, bro. Hit me on Facebook. Message me on Facebook, and I'll um, I'll, I'll relay relay the message. All right, I got a uh, I got a question. Like um, like EQ. Like, is there any particular like EQ techniques that you do? Like, whenever you in your mix to you know find unwanted frequencies, or like, do you? EQ before you compress? Do you compress all the time? Like, you know, just a rundown on that type of stuff. The magic question is, <laughs> what comes first, the EQ or the compressor? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, honestly, man, it, I don't, like I said, when I go into these mixes, it's, it's different every time. Like, sometimes I'll compress first, other times I'll EQ first. Uh, just depends on what's going on, how things were tracked. Um, it's really, yeah, there's it's no rules to this. Uh, as far as EQ methods, um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm trying to think if I do anything out of the ordinary. Uh, I can't say that I do anything, um, special. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and mainly a lot of the stuff like especially in the urban world a lot of the stuff they're getting samples from uh, libraries that have yeah. already been mixed EQ and mastered like so a lot of the times like cause when I first started I would just compress the kick or compress the snare just because I thought that's what you had to do but like if you're giving me like you're kicking your snare and eyes was snatched out of a Dave Pensado session. Clearly Dave did all the work on this thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it sounds good as is. So I might do a tad bit EQing, but it's mainly going to be volume stuff, man. Because it's not like what am I going to do to this that Dave didn't already or whoever they grabbed it from. Um, and wherever they have it, usually it's a volume issue like 99% of the time with me. Uh, I rarely have to do a lot of EQing stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, I mean, the place I'm interning, it's a, a private studio, and it's like, it's it's a pretty dope internship because after the session, like at the end of the night, they just look at me and be like, you got any questions? Then they'll just, you know, give me the rundown on some, some pretty cool tricks. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, luckily for me, um, I've had like when I when I do stuff, it's generally with the the lettuces and the shaka cons and all that kind of stuff. So the it's a minimal amount of work for me. It's more of a performance thing, and they got the performance on lock. So my job is like I'm just kind of on cruise control, and I just let it happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't deal with fixing anymore. Right. Like, I, I don't, luckily, like, I mean, I did, like, a while ago, but since 2008-ish, really, it's kind of, you kind of just get to coast, because uh, your resume will bring in that level of work after a while. And so at that level, there's still, I mean, there's still some stuff to be fixed, but it's, it's on a minor scale. I think the most work I had to do really... Um, was melodyning 
this young lady's vocal, who will remain nameless, but uh, spent like <laughs> twelve hours melodining her lead. Oh, yeah, that bad. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that was like I was like, are you kidding me right now? But I thought she just said minor. <laughs> It was, dude, that was, yeah, that was, <laughs> I wish that on no man. Do you think, like, Melodyne and Autotune, like, I know those are basically, as an engineer, some essential things that you got to know these days? Um, yeah, I mean, Autotune, you know, is pretty much the standard, like Pro Tools is at this point. Uh, and Melodyne is my personal preference. Uh, especially for the music I do, they don't want that processed auto-tune sound. Yeah. So it's more, Melodyne is a bit more natural, um, and it still sounds like that person actually sung it, and you're not hearing stuff getting pulled, and, you know, the electronic sound that auto-tune has. Like, so I, I generally tend to rock with Melodyne. Yeah, I like Melodyne. That's the one they taught us in school over auto tune, but yeah, it's it's more work, but it's worth it because that vocal is gonna sound natural. I heard tuning vocals is is a money maker too, though within itself. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, you sit down because <laughs> it's a lot of work, but you know, you just sit there and and especially with Melodyne, you just sit there on that that little keyboard layout they have and just go to work on that thing, man. That's what's up. Okay, if if Derek wants a chance at winning a Grammy, what does he have to do? They um, make some great music. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> he makes a great song, but he makes a great song. How does he get it to the Grammy organization? What does he have to do? Um, as a member, you can anybody can submit. Uh, any members can submit their music. And the thing is, you got to be smart with where you submit it, because a lot of people will go and submit their song for song of the year, record of the year, uh, best R&B song, best R&B performance, and then they'll submit another song on their album for this same thing. And so your two songs just canceled each other out, because say half of your fans like this song and the other half like this one, then the voters will be like, oh, I like this one, I like this one. And then everybody else comes through the middle that have one song uh, in those categories. So be smart about how you submit, but anybody can uh, submit as long as you're a member. So we need to find people who have, who are members. Okay. Or or join. Or join. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know how you were talking about earlier about the whole TV thing. You were talking about the Kardashians and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you go about presenting your music to get to, you know what I mean, to get to that, those people that uh, place those records like that, or pieces or whatever you want to call them? Um, that's that's straight up your your network, man. Uh, it's who you know. That's really Not all really it is. Way to answer it. Yeah, there's at like it's literally like the only reason I got in there is because my friend works. Like, the dude I interned with now works for that company. Like, any other, there was no other, like, I didn't see an open call online or whatever. Like, the only thing I can suggest is, like, if you do follow these people on Twitter, they generally, like, sometimes they'll pop up and be like, we're accepting submissions to this Gmail account. And um, I've done that, too, as well. Like, I hit some artists that were, you know, posted their stuff on Twitter, and they hit me back. On Twitter, like I said, Twitter has made me a lot of money. But um, in those situations, it's 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 your network and who you who you know. So really, if you're not in LA or New York or something, then it's really you getting on Twitter, and you know you find one or two people, and you know once you find somebody in this area, it'll tell you you should probably follow these on the side. Go follow all them. And eventually some stuff will pop up and somebody will be looking for some submissions and you can slide in that way. And just kind of, you know, also on Twitter, I like to, you know, chat it up and make conversation with people, even if I don't know them. I'll get up there and 
and kind of talk to them a little bit to uh, to just get them engaged to know like they'll see the name and they'll see six seven music so if it keeps popping up they'll be like who is this that keeps talking to me they're funny they're cool and you go in and that starts a relationship as well and to go up what he said that's how I got my first internship when I moved down here to Georgia DJ Burn one posted I just so happened to be on Instagram and he posted looking for uh, engineer you know to try out you know for pay and I immediately sent my resume and he called me the next day there you go and like yeah. on Twitter, like if you make beats, you can go in the top and type in different stuff like that'll pertain to the conversation. You can type in producer send beats to and a bunch of artists that said that their Twitter handle will come up and you'll have their contact. Like I have pretty much everybody's email address, like of people that are looking for beats that I can actually, you know, submit for for possible placements just because there's people, like he said, there's so many opportunities on Twitter. It's just you got to, you know, like he said, talk to people and communicate. Like if you Google like Twitter etiquette for like a musician, a whole bunch of like tricks and techniques will actually pop up on, you know, how to reach whatever you're trying to reach. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I've been here and that's the way to go, man. I mean, obviously all the social media is great tools, but I hear Twitter, everybody's like, that's how they got on. I hear that so much. It's crazy. Yeah, man. You gotta, you gotta lock in, like, and move with technology, uh, and be in the mix. That's the only way to do it, and to get money. <laughs> so much money to be made. So you would say, like, right now in the music industry, it's still to a point where you can have a, a lucrative career, like financially. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're doing more than one thing, like if you, if you can engineer and you can produce and you can play, like that's three different jobs right there that they got to pay you for. You know what I'm saying? And then with those skills, you can still run over and hop into TV and film. So it's, you know, they have to hire session, session musicians to do scores. You still making money. You know what I'm saying? It's. Tons of income streams going on, songwriting, everything else. There's a lot of money, like on the low, not just the you know having a hit, but the people behind them, and even the people behind independent music. Somebody got you got to get paid. They're paying somebody to do this stuff. Why yep. not be you? Definitely. Cause yeah, I think I was gonna start a uh, YouTube. I had a YouTube where I was like giving tutorials. And then that's when I found out about like sound exchange and you know registering with that before you do stuff like that. So I think I might actually get that another shot too. Yeah, I I forgot about that. Yeah, I do music for web series as well on YouTube. So and those web series now are getting picked up as TV shows. So it's like you kind of gotta don't say no to anything. Have your eyes open everywhere. Yeah. Also. Uh, not to cut you off, but yeah, I registered for um, a cruise the other day to try to do live sound on a cruise ship. Yeah, and that they, they usually lock you down for like six months, but that's that's a good way to do it too. My uh, my homegirl, she's actually uh, from Atlanta, but she started out on a cruise ship, and now she's Janelle Monae's front of house engineer. And you're talking about uh, Amanda. Amanda, yeah, yeah. And it's crazy because I met her on a mega bus <laughs> going to Atlanta. There you go. <laughs> like, yeah, like, like he said, man, like one thing I've definitely learned, because like I said, I'm just now getting out here, out here these last two years, like going to conferences and beat battles and different stuff. Like I've met so many people just off of that, that it's like you said, you just def you definitely got to be in the mix. Yeah. Yeah, man. You just got to uh, talk it up, yo. Don't be scared to, uh, you know, at, when you go to mixers and different events, just just talk. Work the room. Because, yeah, Amanda put me on game about Atlanta's, uh, you know, intern uh, music scene. That, yeah, it definitely helped out. So, yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, she definitely she's doing the thing. She's a beast. That's right. Man. But, um, as far as the, so you was around during, like, the analog days, too, right? <laughs> 
I mean, I ain't saying, wait, wait, wait. I ain't saying you like Wait a minute, though. No. Wait, no, wait a minute. No, I'm, like, no, I'm wait, like 29, wait. though, so no. nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 29. Wait a no, minute. No, I'm saying, like, I know you, you've been around, like, all the old school, like, Vets. I was around like analog gear. Yeah, yeah I'm saying like, do they yeah, do yeah. a lot of people? Do <laughs> like, wait a minute. Pro Tools was on like five at least when I came in. Dang. No, but I'm saying like, do a lot of people still like do a lot of analog stuff, or is it like mostly in the box? Um, as far as production or engineering. I mean, kind of on both, because I noticed that like Pharrell don't even use a lot of like outboard like analog instruments other than like guitars and stuff but mainly he uses yeah. like logic and I think just blaze uses like Ableton live and stuff like that right um, I mean those are really convenient and everything uh, and even I think uh, Jimmy and Terry have kind of switched over to logic they were uh, we were switching over to logic as I left but um, I don't know when I was when I was with Jimmy and Terry I'll tell you from that experience it was uh, more analog as far as production goes. It was more analog. Um, in Jam's room, we had that big Korg Oasis keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, we had three keyboards on the right side of the room, three keyboards on the left side of the room, and that Oasis and uh, you know uh, SSL AWS console. So that room was pretty much analog. Like everything was coming out of those keyboards, so if he wanted a different sound on the track, he'd go to a different keyboard. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, with that with that stuff, you got to play it live from top to bottom, which means you got to be a better musician uh, than a lot of guys out right now. But um, for that side of it, yeah, and then for engineering, um, I think the only time we I really had to use a tape machine was... When I was taking old stuff, like some old Boys to Men records or something, off of tape and just transferring it to Pro Tools because they just needed it for a show or something. Uh, and um, I think when we did the Time or the original Seven album, uh, Matt Marin, who's the other engineer there, um, who I learned a ton of stuff from, that's my dude, uh, he would, I think when they got done with the mixes, because Matt mixed everything, they took them and ran them through a uh, half inch and then ran them back into Pro Tools. Gotcha. Yeah, outside of that, um, I mean, we didn't track to tape uh, while I was there. But yeah, because I noticed, like, in different genres, like, like when I was in Nashville, it's, like, way more purist. Like, they all, like, most of the bands that I dealt with, Oh yeah. they was recording straight to tape. Like, they weren't even... Oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's that's also really expensive now. Like that costs a lot to have that much tape to be cutting on tape every day. Yeah. Like yeah, Urban Music don't got the budget for that. So the best we'll do is raise the sample rate. Maybe it'll sound better, but <laughs> that's you're not gonna get the. You might run your your final through a, through some analog, but yeah, we weren't really tracking through a tape machine, unfortunately. It would have been dope, but it don't happen too much on this side of the world. Gotcha. As far as your mixes go, um, I know you, you said you use the, the UAD stuff a lot, but do you use like a hybrid setup where you do have some outboard pieces of gear kind of just to run through for color or sound and things like that? I mean, that's what I kind of do. I, I have a couple of pieces here that, you know, if it calls for it, yeah, I'll run it out into this, you know, the CO one B or my or my three three six oh nine and just for that real sound, even though the UAD stuff I have a hard time kind of you know, I could set the controls exactly and compare them and I'm kinda like I, right. I don't know the difference. But, you know, do you have do you know, employ a setup like that? Um majority of the time it's it's straight in the box, man. I'm, I'm all in the box, and UAD made my life, you know, like you said, so much easier. The more uh, analog replication stuff is coming out, is uh, you know, the tape machines and everything else is like, wow, this is really close uh, to the original, about as close as it can get via the digital side. So, uh, nah, pretty much, it's it's all in the box. Um, 
for the most part, unless I'm going somewhere else to mix. Like, when I'm mixing that crib, it's in the box on the laptop. Keep it, keep it simple. What dog do you use? Um, Pro Tools, but for production stuff, I use uh, Studio One and Logic uh, oh, Pro Tools. Man. That's exactly the same three things I use. Yeah, and I mean, the majority of the time, like I said, I have a Phantom, I have a Motif, and I have an MPC. So, like, 99% of the time, it starts there. And I rarely use software synth. Like, it's always uh, the digital stuff. I use um, Studio One, like, when I'm running Contact and all that good stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's mainly, you know, hands-on analog gear, because when I... I learned this from Jimmy and Terry, too. Uh, when you have a bunch of different keyboards, you tend to play them different. Like, I don't play my Motif like I play my Phantom because it feels different. The keys are different. The Motif weighs more. So I tend to play that different. And I have a Wurlitzer. I play that different than I would playing a Wurlitzer on a Phantom. Like right? just playing a Wurlitzer sound. So uh, it brings a different vibe to the record uh, when you have a different keyboard producing different sounds. So... Uh, I like to kind of stay out of the box when I'm creating. And I thank you for saying that because I was wondering, like, why I've been so, you know, stagnant lately as far as music go, creating it, just yeah. using a MIDI key. Like I said, because I started off, you know, playing instruments, so it's like just using so many plugins and looking at a little-ass laptop screen, you know, and using the same MIDI keyboard, plastic keyboard, it's like, the only time I feel like I'm grooving is actually when I'm playing my guitar, you know, hooking it up to my inbox or something like that. But as far right. as dropping synths and all that other stuff, because I think I my homeboy had a uh, was an MPC 2500, mm -hmm. and like, cause I'm a big record collector, and he um, let me see it. So I'm just sitting there for like a week. I like move my computer away, just have my MPC and just my records, and I was just sitting there getting my deal on. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. And it felt it felt much better. That's why I think I'm instead of my setup is just a laptop and you know MIDI keyboard, I think I'm gonna actually either buy like a drum pad, like an MPD or a machine, or I actually might just go ahead and buy me an MPC just Dude. People be thinking like I got a twenty five or something. Yeah. No sir. It's about the sounds that you have in there. And, it's the texture. And this in the back. Because you're not getting that from a MIDI controller. Like, the electronics of this and the D to A and all that good stuff, like, it's a whole different... It sounds different. It punches yeah. harder, like, the MP. Like, it's just different. And so, like, I can't... I don't know. I've been trying... I tried to rock with MIDI controllers. But, like, I don't really have to do that much mixing when I'm coming out of here. Because it has this punch that no other thing can duplicate. Like, yeah, the sound sounds good as it is. But once you run it through here and it goes through some pre's and into the computer, at that time, it just has this sound that can't be duplicated or that you would have to EQ or whatever if you was just using a MIDI controller. So, Have, have you tried Machine at all? Uh, my boy had it uh, this Christmas, and so he was letting me mess around on it. I like, And it's cool as far as uh, the technical side, you know, being able to do tricks and stuff, but... Uh, Audio wise, like it's it's still a controller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, that's the only thing that gives me that hardware workflow feel. Rather, it's it's a, f a lower latency than than regular MIDI. That has right. a lot to do with it for me. But I understand what you're saying about the MPC sound and the D to A and all that makes a big difference. Didn't people used to hype up their D to A's on the on the old 60s and all that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and uh, what's his name? Forat uh, here still customizes him joints and will. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, he'll tweak them out for you. Um, and I have some pictures. I'll post them up on Pensado's thing. Uh, but, like, when I would have to take Jimmy and Terry's MPs to get uh, repaired or whatever, I had, like, a back seat of my car was just nothing but MPC because they have, like, 10 of them. So my whole back seat was just filled with MPs everywhere. It was so dope, but uh, <laughs> and they they, they still like, use them. Today. They still use them. Yeah, they have like 
five three thousands, I think, the special editions, the black ones. And, and they have the swing different on there? On three thousands? Yeah, they have the threes, they have a couple of twenty fives, they have a sixty. Uh Jam had a one thousand, but I uh use a different operating system on my one thousand, so I ended up bringing mine in all the time. And uh like a lot of the records that I ended up doing, like uh some Elder Bar stuff and everything else. I did that on the one, like no real EQ needed, just you know. Dope, yeah, dope they sound. Snap, it's, it, it sounds so much better. I ran some some 808s that I had in a drum kit, and I put it through the uh, 2500, and it sounded completely different. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's. I mean, as good as digital is, you still can't match analog yet. I don't know if they ever will be able to, but. Um, I, I don't know, I'm just an analog guy, being a musician first. Like, I like to touch, and I want to feel like the heavy MPC in my lap or on the table while I'm hitting it. Like, the little light controllers can't do it for me. I'll punch a hole in one of the things. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that. Yeah. So you think, is it is it because you've been around Jimmy Jam and uh, Terry all this time that that's why you just never... Converted to just strictly just in the box production, or is just like you said, um, musician first. I think it's it's both. Like, cause I had that that mindset of before I got there, I still I had my motif and I was doing everything, and uh, I would create everything. I would sequence everything inside the motif, and um, and then when I got there, I was like, oh wait, this is okay to you know. To stay on the keyboard, not necessarily go on the sense and uh, VSCs and everything. So I was like, "Oh, it's all right." And we made a ton of records that are just 100% no in the box, nothing. Like just all, all of us in there doing whatever. Whether they're playing stuff, I'm playing whatever. Like we made a good amount of records like that. So I was like, "Well, I'm gonna just keep rocking like this because it feels good." You know what I'm saying? I'm sure I'll be forced to dive more into the digital stuff at that point, but yeah, I mean, it feels right, and if they keep making keyboards, I'm going to keep buying them. Yeah, I mean, I think the only keyboard that I just won't want is probably like a Rhodes. That's probably about it. That thing is God's gift to music. Uh, yeah, my homeboy, <laughs> he got a, I went on my homeboy crib in Nashville, he had a a Rhodes and a Warlitzer, and he had a uh, just a little little uh, desktop like synthesizer. Yeah. Craigslist, you can get a, a Rhodes, and he had the Fender amp that goes with the uh, Fender Rhodes. Mm -hmm. That sits he on yeah. He, he said he got it all for like seven hundred on Craigslist. Yeah, you can find yeah great Rhodes deals, and then you just gotta. The thing is, they're analog, so the upkeep on them, um, you gotta get those times and everything repaired and keep it tuned. I mean. It's an amazing instrument, so it's it's well worth it. No, I say I, I I enjoy my internship because they make they send me on these errands, and I already cool with a dude that that fix keyboards. Like he has a move right now. He has a move from back in the day to for sale, and they send me to an old head to his house that all he does is soldering, and he's about to do a soldering workshop like on an SSL <laughs> on an SSL. So I'm gonna learn how to solder too. So oh yeah, we in there, man. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, just develop those relationships, man. Keep them in your back pocket, and you'll you'll need them eventually. If anybody has a good old, um, good shape Hammond B3, if I could convince my wife to let me have it in the house, boy, I wouldn't leave the house for months. Hey, I'll call. I'll call that dude for you uh, tomorrow. Cause like the one I was talking about, the the first guy I met, like that's his main hustle. Like he fixes B3 organs. You know what I'm saying? Like. Cause I had to go pick up some tubes for a, a B3 organ, yeah. so I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he'll know. And it's in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'll holler at him for you if you want me to. Put me on an organ any day. I mean, I, that's that's the thing about this. Like I've been, you know, of course we I'm in Atlanta, so I'm dealing with mostly hip hop, R&B, pop, and rock. But please get me into Nashville for one. Yeah. Get me one good plug. Just, I mean, if I gotta change the toilet, <laughs> do some trash can work so I can be in a room while that amazing <laughs> stuff is going on, and you know, 
the organ players, you know, t- tires got slashed that day, and I happened to be in the studio. <laughs> you know that's why i like interning for like i guess like producers that influenced me because i grew up listening to rock music i got on hip-hop like super late you know what i'm saying like 16 17 of course it was in my house but just me naturally like i was just out playing for like rock bands so like the studio i interned for like the band that they're recording right now, they're just amazing. And then just watching them do their overdubs and seeing so much vintage equipment I've never heard of. Like, I promise all day before I got on here, I'm just looking up, like, the the, the equipment list and just looking and half this stuff, they don't even make it no more. So. Yeah, man. Hey, Tremaine, man, I appreciate the information, man. I got to run out and do husband duties. But um, yeah, I'm going to drop my information up in your inbox, man. So whenever you're in Atlanta and stuff like that, and, you know, we'll definitely link up if you got the time. And Absolutely. Yeah, it was nice meeting everybody. Y'all have a good one. Next hangout, y'all be good. Later, man. All, All right, right, man. See you, man. All right, See you, man. Yes, sir. Tremaine, can oh. I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. How many mixes do you do in a month? In a month? <laughs> Average. Uh, let's see. How many um, songs? Right now is probably like five. It's not like some outrageous number because uh, it's just it's slow at the moment. But it just depends. Like if I'm doing like lately, people have been coming to me with their whole album, which is good. Instead of doing the one-off songs, so uh, yeah, I try to knock out like if I'm doing a whole album like and it's busy, I try to do two a week. Um, kind of like to you know take my time, and uh, and I you know and this is me sending them the first mix because then it goes to the. Mix one, mix two, mix two point one, because they only want the vocal up. Then mix three, mix four, mix five. And you know what I'm saying? That process is a whole other beast within itself. Uh, especially doing it online, like if the person isn't in the city, then it gets messy because uh, there's a disconnect in communication. Yeah, no, to understand. That's, yeah, that's so, one hundred percent of what I do. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's that's the that's the sloppy part. Like I can get you your mix back fairly quick, but then it comes to the the How minor do details. Yeah, and it's like I don't like the way the piano sounds, but then they can't tell you what they don't like about it. So then it's the guessing game. It's like too much. What do you want? So tell me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, I had one person, and uh, it you know. Y'all get it trying to translate what uh, what artists are telling you. And I had one person, uh, I'm mixing her record, and thank God the producer was there to translate because she was like, my vocal isn't warm enough. And I was like, it Low ran bash. through a, a neve. No, it ran through a neve. It ran through a tape machine. It ran through a studer. I was like, do you want me to put Pro Tools in the oven right now? Like... <laughs> How much I want, can he wanted one, she wanted a hat. Right. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what else I could possibly do. And then the uh, producer talks to her, and he comes to me. He's like, Oh, she just wants a little more reverb. Wow. What? 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 <laughs> I was like, You're not even in the same. What are you? What? Yeah, you're using the wrong words. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, Don't, don't use the word just because you heard somebody else say it. You don't even know what it means. So, uh, it's, it's the same thing. When you uh, say it's in a major scale to some producers who generally work in EDM. Uh, it's the same they, thing. They're the same it, way? It's like, I don't know. What, what's theory, man? You just this theory thing. You, are you trying to be educated for something? You're like, it's just basic terminology, man. Ah. Yeah, they don't... I mean, you know, that's we're the... Of the, I mean, everybody that works in music is technically a nerd, but we're the nerdiest on the yeah, <laughs> on the food I, chain. You know what I'm saying? I, I, <laughs> I, like I said, I've been in this for like a, probably a year or two, and I've noticed like it's hard for me to even tell anybody what I went to school for. Like if I say 
I went to school for audio technology. They look at me like, oh, you work on cars. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you doing car stereos at Best Buy for yeah. real? Yeah, I'd be like, audio. And they like, audio. I'm like, sound. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the dude that press record. Okay, okay, that's all you need. That's, yeah, I'm the glorified tape player. That's me. Man. The tape machine. Yeah, dude. I mean, well, that's, that's the game. How do you how do you straight like if you hear somebody that that's doing music like just starting out but you hear so much potential in them like how do you stress the importance of getting your music mixed and mastered so you can compete at a professional level? Um, that's usually the first thing out of my mouth. Like when I when they play me something, I'll tell them I'll be like, "Yo, this is this is really dope. Uh, you know, you got a lot of potential." But I, and then I tell them straight up, I was like, the thing that's going to make or break you is your mixes, like, period. You can go play a great record. Like, say Adele, though her songs only had two or three instruments, if you go play that record at the label and the strings are up here and the piano's here and Adele just chilling at the bottom, nobody's going to want to hear that song. Like, that will make or break the entire thing. So no one's going to hear the vocal. Like, your mix is vital to everything. And I was like, if you're going to pay for anything and you don't know how to mix, pay for a mixer to mix your stuff. And it'll put you light years ahead of so many people because folks trying to do it themselves and they suck at it. Oh. And they think it's great because <laughs> they got the bass all the way up. But in reality, it's like it's all bass and nothing else. So, uh, yeah, I tell people that like straight out the gate. And most of the time they listen, thankfully. But it's like the mix will make or break um, <laughs> I, I, I'll here. tell people they won't listen. Like I saw, I saw a guy the other day. He posted a snippet on Facebook, and I was like, "Hey man, make sure you get it mixed before you pull out put out the whole song. Like get it mixed and mastered." And he was like, "Okay." Next day, he put out the whole song. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> "They're not listening." Yeah, I said, I said, "Okay, this is a hobby for you. I'm gonna leave you alone." Exactly, and that's what I'm saying. Like these are the the warning signs. Like you gotta you gotta know when. Like and that's that's your warning sign. It's like okay, you didn't listen, and you just did this the next day. I ain't gonna mess with you no more. Yeah, exactly. you're wasting my time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I unfriended that brother real quick. <laughs> As you Dave Hampton flashbacks. You wasting my time. Right. <laughs> you see, like yeah, me and Dave had these. We had one right before this. Uh, Right before this hangout started, me and Dave was on the phone talking about that. Last hangout, he had like I mean, yeah, I just had to have a rant dude. about it. <laughs> yeah, I just had to have a dude pay me for wasting my time. Because, like, I tried to set up, like, a, a Skype meeting because, like I said, I was trying to produce for him because I was trying to tell him I'm not finna just, one, I'm not finna have this conversation just in a Facebook chat. And also, I need to know exactly what you want me to do. I'm not finna just send you some beats and just let you pick through them. Like, I understand that part, but you're not one of those type of artists yet. You know what I'm saying? To where right. I, I don't know you like that. So we set up the Skype day. The next day at the time, he didn't show up. Mm -mm. So a few hours later, he, 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 he tried to Skype, and I said, no, nah, man, that window's closed. Let's try again tomorrow. Same thing happened the next day. Then he started giving me excuses, and he was like, how about you hit? He was like, how about we do it at this time? I was like, how about you pay me $45? Then that'll secure your slot, and then you can schedule the time. But until then, you ain't got we ain't got nothing to talk about. That's, I mean, that's essentially like with our jobs. That's what they're paying for, right? <laughs> Slow clap. Uh, <laughs> but so I mean, they're paying for our time. It. He paid it yesterday. He paid it. Real talk. As he should have. They're, like when I go to the studio, and you don't work. Like we sitting there, and you're not doing no work. You're paying me to be here. You're paying for my time. You're also paying for my services, but you're paying for my time. You're paying for an eight-hour block, so you're going to pay me my day rate whether you did any work or not because I could be somewhere else making money. And so people need to realize that as well because uh, some folks I was working with, they're like, well, you know, we didn't really get anything done today, so, uh, you know, can we give you half your rate? No. <laughs> <laughs> If you go to if you go to your job tomorrow and you don't have any customers, you expect your job to give you half of your pay because they weren't busy? No, you got me here. I could be somewhere else. Pay me what you said you're gonna pay me. 
Exactly. But yeah, I'm. I think that was the the hardest part about this industry. I'm noticing because like growing up, like like I said, I've been through all these genres of music, but it's like. When you get sit down with an artist, some people you can't even explain why they supposed to be paying you. <laughs> they looking like we cool, let's start this group and I'm gonna get famous, then I'm gonna pay you. I'm looking like no, nah, my light bill due um <laughs> it's due on the fifteenth. So what you gonna do is you gonna pay me what you need to pay me or we just ain't gonna work together. Exactly. That's uh the only time that really changes is uh, if I feel like somebody really has the potential to blow, like, and that's my, and that would be in my own personal opinion uh, if I felt that way. But other than that, yeah, it's like this is what I do for a living. Like this is how I pay my bills. I can't call T-Mobile and be like, "Hey, I did this dope record yesterday. Y'all want to hear it instead of me giving you this hundred dollars a month <laughs> for this <laughs> for this phone bill." Like that's not gonna happen. No landlord is taking tracks that you mixed for free exactly. instead of rent. So yeah, people gotta understand, man, like you they don't go to work and their boss asks them to do a bunch of stuff for free. That's what they're doing to you. Like yeah, they need to I, understand. Yeah, I had that. to explain it. I said I'm I don't do volunteer work. It's just nah. Nah, man. You know, it's 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 weird uh working in music because I'm realizing people don't value uh, what we do as much as um, even they do in the film world and everything else. Because you think about it, all this film stuff, even with like uh, the Kardashian stuff, for instance. The ca I'm sure the cameraman got paid, the editor got paid, the producer mm -hmm. got paid. But the film stuff, they don't pay you anything up front. Like, really? We ain't got the budget for that. We'll pay you on the back end, like, and that's all back end. And the only reason I do it is because I know it's the Kardashians, so it'll be huge. But you don't get a front end check on that stuff, man. Nah, like people got it twisted, and it's like that for a lot of films and stuff too. It's like we can't really, we don't really have a music budget, so um, can you do it for free for credit? And we, it's like you don't value what I do. You didn't ask the cameraman to do this for free. And you yeah. surely didn't ask this editor to sit here and edit this whole movie for free, but you want me to do all this music for free. Especially tracks that you probably already got in the stash. They want you to let them see it for free? Yeah. I mean, but that's it even no matter how how high up you go, like you'll just notice that it's not valued as much as everything else, man. And I don't know why that is. Oversaturation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know why. I know why. Because of sound click. <laughs> Son, wait a minute. <laughs> a sound click. Oh, man. I had a sound Look, click. I saw a dude the other day, no lie. He was like on Twitter. I had to block him because it was so disrespectful. He was like, I will sell you 10 beats right now for like $10. I said, bro, a dollar a beat for real? You can't <laughs> have the hour of your beats off, man. Like, you got to <laughs> have some value to this thing, man. I'm not letting... I used to be on SoundClick and people didn't mess with me because I was like, no, this track is going to cost you a minimum of 75 Yeah. Like, at the least. And that was, what, 2002, 2003? I was trying to hit people with that. And they were like, no, I'm not. No, I can go over here and get these beats for $10. Bye. Yeah. It's like they think it's like McDonald's. And then <laughs> I, I, I had to get off SoundClick because of the, the free download. Like, people... I know so many people that rap over free download beat with the tag like playing through the song. Oh, and they be like, check out my right. song. Yeah, and they be like, check out my song. And I hear it, and I stop it, and I be like, no disrespect, but you you didn't even respect this person enough to buy the lease. Like you literally stole his music and rapped over. It. Like I can't respect you. Yep, I had, I had plenty of those kind of records where uh, they would send me the Pro Tools session, and I'm like, so the track isn't tracked out. They're like, nah, I just uh, grabbed it off SoundClick. Uh, so do you know the producer? Are you going to get this cleared? Nah, nah, we're just putting it out on a mixtape. We don't need to get it cleared. <laughs> oh, okay. But right. as far as, like, going, uh, like you said, levels to, you know, this whole thing, like, when you go up as far as the other rappers, do they actually rap the, the uh, track that beats, or is it still two track? Um, It just depends. Uh, it really just depends who the producer is, where they got the track from. 
a lot of these producers, beat makers, just send the two track. They send the you know they send the MP3, and the rapper will go in the studio and cut his vocal to that, and then once they realize, like if they establish that it's going to be on the album, then they'll hit the producer and be like, send me the multi track. Gotcha. So yeah, like a lot. Of, well, and even like I did some stuff with uh, Fifty Cent. We did like three or four remixes. It was straight up the label sent us uh, uh, wave files, just a two track, and we went in and uh, we had the instrumental and we had the the full version, and I just had to Frankenstein it together and put together wherever Fifty wanted to throw his verse. I just yeah. dropped the instrumental in right there and then put the song back in and kind of just pieced it together like that. Never saw a multi-track, and it was on the radio the next day after we left the studio. <laughs> oh my Never, God. like, no real mix. I did, like, a little rough mix because I'm thinking, like, oh, somebody else is going to take this at the label. It was it was on Power 106 the next day. Wow. Yeah. So it, it just depends. Yeah, I think I think Wale's trying to finally realizing that the importance of an engineer, like that artist engineer relationship, because he was he was on Instagram the other day looking for um an uh, engineer to put on salary. I said I it. saw that I saw that. Yeah, because somebody hit me up. I was asleep, but I was like, I'm all the way in Georgia, so I couldn't go all the way to New Jersey. But uh, I said that's. Yeah. What's yeah, I mean that's the that's the thing, man. You need you need consistency uh, as an artist. If you have your team, uh, you know, have one guy. If you have one guy engineer like the majority of your record, those are the records that usually come out the best because it's consistent. As far and then same thing on the production and having only like one or two producers versus having a different one on every track. Like those records, if you look at record of the year for the Grammys, the majority of the time, or album of the year, majority of the time, out of the five nominees, at least two or three of them are going to have uh, only three or four names listed in the credits. There's going to be the artist who probably wrote most of their songs, the producer, and the engineer, and yeah. maybe one other producer. But for the most part, like Adele, Paul Epstein did the majority of that. Like and she stays winning, Paul, and she goes back to what she she knows. Paul Epstein is going to deliver. So when she had to do Skyfall, she went back to Paul Epstein. She didn't go run to Timberland because she won a bunch of Grammys and she hot. Like she went back. Like me and Paul are the winning combination, and so I'm gonna keep doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and that Skyfall, yeah, that record was the truth. Yeah. That's how Kendrick and them do it, right? With his engineer. Yeah, Ali. Yeah. No. Yeah. And he got in-house producers like THC and Willie B and all of them, like Soundwave, yeah. yeah. That's why I'm, but you're right, though, like, if you got your own team, I mean, that's why I be trying to find artists that ain't already owned to work with and try to build relationships with so I can break in the door that way because I already know if I get a 50-cent placement, it's like, unless it's a hit, it really ain't going to matter, you know what I'm saying? So. Correct. That's right. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the move, man. Is to build with an artist. Uh, and I, I always give the the Timberland example. Like Tim came up with Aaliyah. Like we know Timberland mostly because of Aaliyah, Missy, and Magoo. Like that whole little circle. Yeah, genuine. Sam, yeah. yeah, genuine. Yeah, like that whole Virginia Beach crew. They all came up together and started from scratch. And they all just rose together, and then you know it kind of split up. And Tim is everywhere, but uh, I don't know if we could have gotten, like, if we would have been able to take Tim's sound if he would have just had a placement on R. Kelly's record versus him presenting it through him and Magoo and Missy and Aaliyah and Genuine. And you, you chose the perfect word. That, that is exactly right, present. Like, you right, it's basically a presentation. Like, he, he picked this artist and just came, he just showcased his whole production from point A to point B, kind of like Dr. Dre, like organized noise, like right, for, like Forty and Drake's combination right now, like right, winning, you know what I'm saying? So that's gotta, the that's the way to do it, man. You you gotta you know find your artist, and if you're a producer, you know, I, and every great producer has, for the most part, has what made them great was them presenting their own artist. 
like bringing somebody up from scratch. It's not just them jumping on the bandwagon with somebody else and making a bunch of hot tracks. It's I got a bunch of hot tracks and I just brought this to the world. And then uh -huh. this has its own career that is doing what it does. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Exactly. Do you yeah. think um, engineering made you a better producer? Absolutely. That's why I went to engineering school. Was to okay, become a better I, I was producer. making sure because that's what I did. I, it's, it's actually making me more creative and I, yeah. I actually understand it better. Okay, I was just making sure. Yeah, it's the, it's the side of uh, like the things that you hear in your head, the sounds. You mm -hmm. know how to create them because you, you know, you know the technical side, and you're like, okay, I I like that filter that Drake uses, but I don't know how to do it. That can kill a record for you, and you'll stop working on that song because you can't figure something out. But hey, now as an that's engineer, why I went to right there, yeah, I, stopped, I I would be in the middle of a beat, I stopped and was like, how do I do this? How do I do that? So then it went from you working on creating something to now you really getting technical and it's throwing you off of being creative. You know, musically, so right. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the thing, man. Become a, a dope engineer in your production. You know, it'll be far easier. So, who, who is your, like your your um? What who who um inspired you enough to uh, become a producer? Um, clearly, you know, Quincy, uh, Jamin Lewis, uh, Dre, Just Blaze, uh. And a lot of people I didn't even know until now, but uh, like you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know who Rodney Jerkins was. Uh, hey, I Rodney just Jerkins. Him. I ain't know neither. Yeah, so Rodney Jer like Warren Campbell, um, David Foster, uh, who else? Um, ah, crap. Um, 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 somebody I'm forgetting, but uh. Yeah, just, I mean, the majority of them, well, not the majority, oh, Nile Rodgers. Like, and it's like you don't even realize how much of an impact these people play until you, you're you older and you go back and look at their catalog. Mm -hmm. You're just like, oh, my God. Like, I loved all these records. All these records influenced me, and I didn't even know, like, it was Nile Rodgers doing all these hits mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and same with Jimmy and Terry. Like, I told them when I started working with them, I was like, because when you go in there in the studio, they have – the records, like literally the records of pretty much every project they've ever worked on, they saved the outside of the record and they have it framed in the hallways. And so um, it's two or three stories of like on the walls, just all the wall space is taken up by all these records. And you just look and you're like, you did that? I, told them, <laughs> I was like, y'all were literally like, because their career started in like 82, 83. I they was born in 84. With, uh, they came up with... Um, like, didn't they go to school with Prince and yeah, yeah. Orange Day and all that? Okay, cool. Yeah, the whole Minnesota crew. But I, I told them, I was like, y'all's y'all, y'all's career has spanned literally, like, my lifetime. Y'all have been the soundtrack to my life. Like, that was my yeah. only sitting in there with them and, like, like y'all did this record? Y'all did this record? But, yeah, like, stuff like that. I was like, y'all influenced me, and I had no idea it was you at the time when I was a child. And I loved all these records. And so even like, you know, Jermaine Dupree, all that kind of stuff, man. Everything. Dallas Austin. Everybody. Yeah, I think Dilla, I think Dilla, like tracking tracking all the way back to Dilla, like that's what yeah. threw me off. I'm like, you're the reason why people drums are like this, why Kanye samples like this. You know right. what I'm saying? Like why yeah. like I call them Dilla babies, like not premiere, but like um right. rock and and um, all of them, like no ID and right. people like that. So, but yeah, you're right. Right. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, definitely Dilla as well. He's he's uh, I mean, he's Dilla. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other like that. And also the uh, Big Jim Wright and the Avila Brothers. Uh, they were under flight time, but the Avila Brothers, they're the cats that did uh, like most of the stuff on Confessions that Jimmy really? and Terry did. The Vila Brothers did a lot of that, along with Big Jim. And cats don't even know who the Vilas are, but they are nuts. Like being around them made me a better producer because they're so like their their creativity is crazy. Being around them and Jim and Jimmy and Terry, like that's the other thing. If you you need to be around people that are better than you, 
all the time because it pushes you and pushes your creativity to a whole other place. Yeah, because uh, my he put a video up the other, other day of Dave Pensado, and Dave Pensado said if you're in a room and you're smarter than everybody in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Like I, yeah, mm -hmm. like I said, like I interned for Ben, and I just – when I once I found out he did the uh, first Norris Barkley album and he helped uh, produce uh, Crazy off that off that first album, I just mm -hmm. yeah and he 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 uh, intern not intern he engineered for Diddy like I think he said he did um, Biggie's second album and um, a couple a couple of Diddy like Lil Kim and uh, Lil C's album. They everybody at that studio pushed me on game about stuff though. So. Yeah, just yeah, just always be around, you know. And I'm like I'm I'm constantly around Dave uh, Hampton, because Dave will forever know more than me, and I'm constantly trying to learn everything that's in Dave's head because he knows so much and he's experienced so much. That's what's up. You ever heard of a cat named Ronnie Songs? Uh uh. Uh, because I met him in Nashville. He said he he used to work for um he worked with um. George Clinton and like Bootsy Collins, and I was trying to see if anybody else have heard his name before. You get right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot yeah, of them, them cats from that circle then died off from drugs and whatnot. But <laughs> 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 and ain't but a couple of them left, man. They was going but, hard. But you yeah. you in L.A. right? Okay, I I didn't know because I I figured like you know everywhere. Just like anywhere, it's like a small knit community of you know musicians and engineers and producers. Yeah, I mean LA is it is and it isn't, and that's like I said, that's why we're doing that Grammy stuff to try to get all these people in the room together instead of just the word of mouth thing. It's like put everybody face to face, producers and engineers in LA. This being the biggest hub for music, let's uh, let's make it yeah. happen so everybody can see each other and meet each other. That's what's up, cause I plan on being in Atlanta probably like a couple years just to get some of that Atlanta experience. But yeah, my main goal was to always move to LA, cause like I got my sister, she lives in San Diego. Okay. I've never, I've never been on the West Coast, so I'm already knowing that when I do get down there, the first place I'm gonna touch down is San Diego. Okay. Yeah, it's about three hours away. But yeah, join like the Atlanta chapter. I know they do a good amount of stuff. Um, what about the Audio Engineer Society? Huh? The Audio Engineer Society? Oh, AES? You know, yeah. I'm not a member, man. I need to join. Uh, I do need to join, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not a member of them. I mean, but also, my thing is, I live in Columbus, Georgia. It's like almost two hours away. You know what I'm saying? So right. I can't just make moves like that just not yet. I think in like December, we're going to finally... Me and my girl, we finally gonna move to Atlanta. But for okay. now, yeah, as far as me interning, like like I said, for Ben, I have to make that drive like on Mondays and Thursdays. So okay, but, but it's well worth it though. Like I said, but yeah, whenever you definitely come down that way, man, yeah, we definitely gotta link up because yeah, like you said, man, I'm trying to be around people that's that's more experienced and is full of knowledge, man. I'm definitely trying to soak it up. Absolutely, I, uh, yeah, I'll let you know when I'm headed that way. Wow. And uh, Derek, yeah, man, I think I just added you on uh, on here on Google Google Plus. All right, yeah, you on you on the uh, Pensados group? Oh uh, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm always on there talking, man. You see me on there running my mouth. <laughs> All right. But yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm finna get off of here, man. I'm finna uh, like I said, get back to reading articles and books, man. <laughs> That's what's up. But I'm gonna get up with y'all though, man. Appreciate the convo, man. All right, man. Thanks for being in here. All right. All right, y'all be cool, man. All right, Gavin. All right, Derek, any more questions before we close it out? Nah, I think we covered pretty much everything. <laughs> what about you, Mr. Tremaine? Um, not really. I, well, I just wanted to uh, give a shout-out to my dude who's in the Pensado group, uh, Richard Furch. Cause he worked at flight time with me too. That's my that's my homie. Y'all need to do one of these with him if you haven't already. Cause Rich, Rich has worked with everybody as well. A couple of Grammy nominations and everything. 
I saw him on that Usher's Confessions. Uh, yeah, he, Rich Rich was there before me, and then we did some Usher and some Ruben Stuttered, and then he's done Prince and Tyrese and Chrisette Michelle, and Rich Rich stays busy. So, uh, yeah, y'all should definitely do a hangout with him. Because, like, all these people, all these uh, other engineers who I'm name-dropping, mm -hmm. I learn a ton from them. Like, I never walk into a situation and be like, I know it all. Like, these dudes have been doing it longer than me. And I'm like, you clearly know more than I do, so let me see what you got. Mm -hmm. What um, what did you do on the Shaka Khan? What's Shaka Khan? Um, Shaka would come in like every two weeks just for fun, because uh, she stayed around the corner. So we did one thing where like we made some ringtones or so. I have no idea. We were just recording like we had to re-record all her classic songs which was mind-blowing. And so she's in there singing Through the Fire and all this stuff, and then she gave it to a ringtone company, and then we did something for her children's charity where she had to re-sing some song, and then we did another J-pop record, um, and she did a duet with this girl named I, uh, A-I, and uh, they did two songs together. Uh, so Bashaka was in all the time. Nothing ever like was an official release. It was all random, except the the I stuff, but that only got released in Japan. But um, she was in literally all the time. Okay. No, I saw that in the credits, and I was like, let me ask this man, what's up with the shaka? Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's what she was. So now was this painful, bro? No, nah, this is actually pretty fun, y'all. All my friends are texting me because they're watching it right now on YouTube. Ah, y'all. So I'm going to have to uh, catch you out and beg you to be on this again. Uh, <laughs> nah, man. Whenever whenever y'all uh, whenever y'all want me back, I'm down to do it. Darche has been in some of them. Uh, sometimes she'll be here. I was actually going to do a switch a rule like turn the camera back on and it'd be her sitting be <laughs> that would have messed how, me up that's how I do these guys sometimes um, <laughs> just having fun most of the time <laughs> yeah so all right cool. do you guys have any questions for him before we head out no appreciate yeah, it man. though man no problem man anytime <clears throat> and uh, you know if y'all got any questions you can Shoot me a message on Facebook, and I'll do my best to get back in a timely manner. Awesome. Bro, we appreciate you. Um, let me see how long. We started somewhere around 3, say 2.45. It's 7.05. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Didn't feel like it. You've been on this thing this whole time. Wow. That many hours, almost four hours, going on four hours. Right? Was it three hours and whatever, a few minutes? Yeah. Three hours no and females. Minutes. That was a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Um, I'll be hitting you back up sooner or later. Um, I would like to do another one with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll figure it out. Um, somebody was asking about um, seminars and stuff. Uh, I think it was Gavin. Um, but Khalid Glover might have one coming up in the April time frame um, out in L.A. Um, yeah. I, when I left you guys that day at the, um, at the Recording Academy, mm -hmm. um, me and Darche went over to one that Raven was having that Khalid was on, doing the engineering for the... Oh, you know, I saw that, the red carpet thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, we went over there straight from what y'all, the stuff with y'all, the very next morning we were over there with Khalid for two days. Um, and now, now that was Ravens, and now Kalik is getting ready to throw his. Um, okay. And what Kalik does is he ends up bringing, he'll throw a seminar, and I thought it was just going to be him, but it was like five, six other industry cats yeah. in the seminar also, and then they would do their thing and then come kick it with us in the audience um, yep. for the rest of the seminar, and that was just priceless. So that's the um, only other thing that I know of that's coming, in, unless any of you guys know anything else that's coming up. All right, that's it. Music Massa in March, but that's in Germany. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
heard about that. What is it? Uh, it's basically NAM for Europe. What's you it called? Oh. Music Messe. Zeke what? Music Messe. It's, it's German. Music it's like Messe. M-U-S-S-I-K or something like that? I'll yeah. type it out. Yeah. You sound like you said Music Massa. I'm like, Massa. There you go. Yeah, M-U-S-I-K. Oh, that's how you say that. Okay. It is. I pronounce it with an accent. Okay. I, I'm Dutch. And <laughs> I also know German. Uh, you look like a swashbuckler, like Errol Flynn <laughs> and, and um, was it, the Three Musketeers and stuff. You cool with me, bro. <laughs> um, all right, then. If that's it. If nobody has any other questions, we're going to get Jermaine back on here um, another time and, and find out all the stuff he didn't tell us that he don't want us to know. <laughs> we don't want to know, man. So, all right, the then. waves plugins. Yeah, talk about the waves. <laughs> in, in the ocean? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but all right. All right, everybody. Peace out. All right, guys. All right, y'all. See ya.